Thank you. Now I invite Professor Michael Arundas, Secretary, SRBC, to initiate the proceedings. Good morning to Onantal. Uh, this is the most important event in the annals of the Society for Reproductive Biology and Comparative Endocrinology. Before going into that, uh, for the newcomers, a brief uh, introduction about the society. See, this is one of the most vibrant societies in India. It's 41 years old. And every year, we used to have our annual meetings at different centers uh, in India. It was in 1980, the founder of the society, Professor P. Govind Rajalu, who was uh, also my mentor, initiated this uh, event at the Taramani campus of the University of Madras. Dr. Basu from Jipmar was also along with him to initiate this uh, movement. And from then, we have never turned back. We have been moving ahead, except for two occasions, we could not, due to unavoidable circumstances, conduct the meetings. Last year, it was pandemic. So we are supposed to have this meeting at Trivandrum. Then we postponed it to my, and this year to Mysore. And I'm thankful to Dr. Malini and Dr. Shivanandapa for making this even real. Because again, in between the uh, trouble of pandemic came, uh, we'll be able to proceed with the organizational meeting. And some people are suggesting only online. But we took our uh, put that it should be a hybrid meeting of having both online and offline. I'm thankful to all of you for making uh, coming here and making this even uh, a successful one. You, you will be enjoying the proceedings uh, during the last uh, next three days. And uh, I have seen the abstracts. There are wonderful papers from young scientists. And the society also awards the young scientist uh, best paper awards, best paper, best uh, poster presentation. We'll be giving three, paper, three prizes in the name of one of our past presidents, late Dr. N.J. Chinai. And then we'll also have uh, various orations. One such is, and the first one was uh, named after Professor Pera Govindarajulu, I do uh, gold medal oration. It was initiated by uh, his students as well as his well wishes in the Society for Reproductive Biology and Comparative Endocrinology with the seed money of one lakh rupees about uh, 18 years back. And this is the 17th oration. And the main criteria for uh, selecting the awardee will be, he, should be a, he or she should be a life member of the society. He have been regularly attending the meeting for the past five years, at least three meetings during the past five years. And there, Publications of international journals, we consider into mainly the refereed journals with high impact factor and citations and H index. And also their academic achievements, wherever they are. And it will be 
based on their CV and publications, a committee of past presidents will screen and recommend the awardee to the executive committee. And the executive committee, with the permission of the general body, will be uh, awarding or uh, selecting the body and award or confer this uh, gold medal oration. And we will be formally get the acknowledgement from the general body tomorrow. But it is always customary that this gold medal oration of Professor Pera Govindarajalu will be delivered by the awardee the first day immediately after the keynote address. And this year's awardee is Dr. Malini Laloria, please come to the stage. Dr. Malini is a senior scientist in the Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, Toronto. He had her earlier education and uh, her uh, doctorate uh, and also her earlier career at uh, Devi Akalya University, and subsequently, she did her postdoctoral uh, research in the University of Virginia, USA, and came back and joined as a faculty member in uh, Devi Agalia University. And at present, she is one of the leading molecular reproductive biology scientists working in the Rajiv Gandhi uh, Center, and she has nearly 100 top ranking research papers with very good uh, uh, impact factors and citations. And she's working on the ovary at present on the molecular aspects of the uh, function development and other things. And she's also an elected fellow of the different societies. Uh, uh, our own society conferred her the fellowship in uh, reproduction and endocrinology in 2019. And she's an elected fellow of the National Academy of Science, the NASI, and also elected overseas fellow of the Royal Society of Medicines from May 2018. And he has, uh, she has uh, uh, been given many uh, orations, including uh, Dr. G.P. Talwar Gold Medal Award in 2020 on infertility. And then she was a rainy visiting professorship at the University of uh, Western Australia and visiting fellowship under Healthy Babies program of NIH and so on. And this is one of, I'm proud to say that the Society for Reproductive Biology and Comparative Endocrinology has life members with the proven uh, ability in scientific research and academic excellence. And one such is Dr. Laloria. And the society is pleased to confer the Professor Govinda Rajulu Gold Medal Oration 2020 on uh, Dr. Laloria. I request the past president, Dr. A.V. Ramachandran, and Dr. to endocrinology on this day of 28 December 2021 at Mysuru, signed by the Secretary Professor Michael Arunlas and 
the vice president dr suresh so sir ye bhi ramachandran will be present it was my pleasant duty last year i gave the medal i mean the society on behalf of the society to her husband and this year it is the wife and it's such a strange coincidence that both the husband and wife have shared the honor and the society is also honored by their participation and it recognizes them equally although it is just one year apart i'm sure pradeep is senior to her in age therefore you in our tradition seniority is respected <laughs> now i request dr malni to present her oration being a oration award there will not be any questions and it will be for about 40 to 45 minutes and if you have any clarification to make you can get it done privately with dr malni please i hope i am audible so well i work in rajiv gandhi center for biotechnology okay does it not work okay yeah i think it finally worked one slide went. yes well so first of all i think i sh i am really humbled to be getting this award and actually it was a very pleasant surprise when professor devi are called me and uh, i'm really grateful to all the people all my seniors who have given me their blessings and found me worthy of being nominated as well as the srbc committee who found who thought that i'm worthy of this medal of the society so i deeply thank the all the members of the society for conferring this award to me now this is for the younger people if because he is not there professor govindra rajulu uh, the award is in his name and uh, he was the former professor and head of department of endocrinology anna university chennai and former director dr l m post graduate institute of basic medical sciences as well as the registrar and president faculty of science university of madras so this is for actually the students probably who are not seeing him here because he is not there here so well i work on a topic which is actually very uh close to me from the starting like as a kid also growing up i wanted to be a scientist and i wanted to work in this field so and the best it is you know uh, you can see the mother and child relationship is the most uh, important one and uh, this is a lovely painting by pablo picasso on that and why is it important because in these days you know you have uh, so many diseases which are being talked about and definitely we have to put focus on understanding diseases dealing with diseases like currently we are facing the pandemic but we must understand that if we don't focus on reproduction this is the only process which can gives the continuity of species so we are in reproductive biology and we have to inspire our students that this is a field which is the most important because or else we all will be extinct i joke when younger students come to me that you will not have to study any disease if no human being is born because there will be nobody who will be affected by the disease so we have to be born and then only comes the entire story so uh, the oocyte and the sperm you know interact and you have fertilization and after fertilization the embryo attaches and this is called as the window of implantation because it does not attach any time the uterus is actually a hostile territory it does not allow attachment of the embryo and why is this so important because 
maximum fecundity is only 30% and 75% of losses during pregnancy are because of implantation failure. And we still fail to understand implantation failure in the human being because of paucity of material, you can't get the human endometrium. It's not ethically allowed to get human endometrium at this time of implantation. Although our population is budding, but you must realize that countries which have a very high population rate also have a very high infertility rate. Therefore, my lab's focus has been studies on embryo implantation as well as instrument. Uh, embryo development and now so this is a very old picture this is actually to show the university students that this was a picture taken in BAVV on uh, in vitro fertilization which we used to do in our lab and all those these all these embryo beautiful pictures are taken in a normal fluorescent microscope not a confocal microscope so the person who is taking the picture their dedication also is very important even if you get high in machines so therefore this process where the embryo has to attach to the uterus is very critical. And as I said, failed implantation in all IVFs, you know, you, uh, the IVF clinics can do in vitro fertilization, but when they put the embryo in the mother, they only have 25 to 30% success rate because we don't know what is happening, why they, it is not attaching. It is defined as the black box of assisted reproduction. And so we need to understand this process, but the challenge is you will not be able to get human material. So my group has been working on this on different aspects on implantation. Uh, and I will not be able to cover all of these, but we do have different uh, processes which are under study and the major importance of uh, and the negotiator for this process is an ideatory estrogen which was known in mouse you know since several years decades maybe since 40 50 years it was known that you need an estrogen surge over a progesterone background one of the questions which I always faced when I went to give uh, defend my grants was, this is happening in the mouse. It doesn't happen in the human. How will you relate it to the human? I used to tell, well, if somebody is ready to give me blood, you know, during this time, I'll be happy to look at it. Because by the time a woman knows that she is pregnant, she, the implantation phase is already over. That would mean that after an intercourse, they should be giving blood. So UK requested, and in 2000s only they could, after 2000, they requested women and they could get blood from women and they could map that estrogen surge does happen in the human also. So the other important part here is that the embryo has the father's set of genes. That's foreign to the mother, right? So the mother's body wants to attack the embryo. So there is a lot of immune reaction happening. Uh, some people say that implantation is a pro-inflammatory. So there's a wave of pro-inflammation, which is then suppressed. And then there is also, it is almost manipulated the mother's body so that the immune system is suppressed. So the mother requires tolerance to the embryo, which is a foreign body, which for it is a foreign body. Similarly in cancer, tumor also actually is not a foreign body, but the patient's body acquires tolerance. And this is done by a class of T cells, which I'll come to later called as T regulatory cells. So I will, so for the students, the processes which go on is apposition, addition, then invasion, and then decidualization. So what I say is normally, like if you compare it with tumor, all these happen. And one more process which I'll talk about, which is not put in this is the epithelial mesenchymal transition. So this happens, but here during pregnancy, the mother's body knows how to curtail the invasion, how to stop the spread. But in tumor, the patient's body loses that control. So people now have mapped 
no it has been known since some time so in the mouse it is on day 5 the window starts at day 4 and ends at day 5 10 am in mouse while in the human that's why i said by the time the female knows that she is pregnant the embryo has already attached that is the blastocyst hatching occurs start of window at day 6 apposition day 7 day 8 addition and implant invasion finally day 9 and this completes the window so but you cannot get samples it is not ethically allowed so we use mouse as a model and you can say why mouse because you know you should use a primate but mouse is actually close to the human in the type of implantation the type of decedia and the type of placenta so all over the world people study mouse as a model and also you can then knock out the gene to see whether it is affecting implantation so i will not be able to cover what all i have worked but i thought i'll show you some salient things so one is the addition process is important and this is mediated by integrins and other addition molecules like cadherin and in that network it is known that doc is important in transducing these signals from outside of the cell to inside of the cell causing stronger addition by causing actin polymerization so we were exploring this uh, molecule called as doc in implantation and we came across a, actually a very strange uh, a finding which was you know so students have to be very observant what you are looking for if you see something odd focus on that try to pursue that so this is known to be involved in neur neuronal development and cytoskeletal reorganization in phagocytosis cytosis and cancer but what we found was we saw a nuclear doc so the person who also made doc knockout also has had not seen this and so this is not then a conventional role you see it is present in the nucleus only on a particular day before implantation i'll show you better so if you see the partition one here this is the nuclear so you see nuclear presence of doc which was very surprising for us and when you give hormone so it looks that it is only hormone mediated under special circumstances of implantation you see dog going into the nucleus but what does it do nobody knows about it and here you see it's very much nuclear because it's co localizing in the nucleus while here you can see it outside when only progesterone is there so and uh, if you block with enadiol or are you 486 it is blocked and it's more clear in a cell line when you use an endometrial epithelial cell line when you have no treatment it is outside if you have vehicle still it is outside but the moment you give progesterone and estrogen mimicking implantation scenario you see it going into the nucleus and well these are the antagonist so we did a bioinformatic prediction and we could uh, see that it has a New, uh, scope of 17% scope of nuclear localization and then we look for a nuclear localization signal and it does have a monopartite nuclear localization signal interestingly both mouse and human have it but not the drosophila doc so during evolution it has acquired the nuclear localization signal now another group also saw presence of doc in the nucleus in hela cells and mcf7 which are both cancer cells but till date they had nobody had found its function so what we did is we did bioinformatics modeling and we could find that doc has an important beta like structure so what are importance what do they do so nuclear translocation of molecules is through the important beta so mm, proteins have a nuclear localization signal it will bind important alpha and important alpha binds important beta and it takes the molecule into the nucleus and then it goes back this is a energy requiring step interestingly only with important beta also nuclear translocation is possible and this is done with uh, by important beta alone without the help of alpha and this is more done for proteins which like histones srebp and rna binding proteins so we thought 
Now, how do you know what molecule is it taking inside? So we did a immunoprecipitation and a proteomics approach, and we could find that DOC took a molecule called as an autoimmune regulator in air, which is called as air. And this molecule, so we have done modeling studies and predicted that it can take, DOC can take air into the nucleus. And then we silence DOC. So if DOC is silenced, okay, air should be there because you have not silenced air, right? But what we got was air was, okay, here. So air was very much there in the cytoplasm in silenced one and in the control one. But DOC is silenced here and in control it is there. But if you look at air, air was not there. So that means it is true that it is DOC which is taking air because when you remove DOC, air can't reach the nucleus. So this gave it the proof that DOC translocates air into the nucleus. And I'll just skip some of these now. So silencing DOC therefore inhibited air is a transcription factor and I'll come to it a little bit more deeper what air does in two minutes. So all the downstream targets of air known targets were downregulated in silenced one. Now you would wonder how you silence. So in those days, well, now people are doing in vivo silencing, but in 2005, six, we actually struggled very hard. And my student took around two years to master this technique. That is we, what we'll do is after the animal is pregnant, we ligate here. And in the same animal on one side, we give control siRNA and on the other side, we give doc siRNA. So you see these blue sites, these are the implantation sites. And in a mature animal, you see these fetuses on the control side, but nothing on the DOC siRNA silence slide. And we found that along with the air ta downstream targets, the addition markers and angiogenesis markers also were affected. And this paper came out in American Journal of Reproductive Immunology, which is a site journal. And in a separate study, we had also found air to be an interacting partner of ER. I had a student, Dr. Anjani AP, working on estrogen receptor alpha signaling. And she had in her data also air coming up. So that, and silencing, as we said, dog blocked air. So thus, air we thought is a very key molecule in regulating pregnancy. And so we expanded our studies on that. So what was known about air till then? Well, air was first found in APCD patients where it is mutated. They have an immune disorder, okay? And air is now known to bind DNA. And interestingly, first work of air binding to DNA was Dr. Pradeep's paper along with mine in Florida in Jin Shuang's lab where we, he was working on air. So we showed that air can bind DNA. After that, you have uh, Diane Mathis and Pat Peterson working very aggressively on air. And uh, so what it does is actually air causes peripheral expression of genes in the thymus. So why it is important in tolerance is these genes are expressed. Our thymus understands that these genes it has to tolerate. Right, so what is, so it does clonal deletions of those memory T cells, so that when our body expresses those genes, they are not attacked by our own body. So this is what is called as air has a very important role in both central and immune tolerance. So prevention of autoimmune attack of our own antigens. And so it does promiscuous gene expression. All our genes are expressed in the thymus. And then they are deleted. Those clonal cells are deleted. So as I said, air has role in uh, self antigen presentation, clonal deletion, Treg induction. These are the classical roles of air. And so air is called as master of many traits because by that time we had found that air can bind to DNA and it has several domains. So probably that gives him the, vir it, the virtue of doing so many jobs like uh, car domain, sand domain, PhD domain. Now, defects in air genes. So APECD syndrome, which is autoimmune polyendocrinopathy candidiasis, ectodermal dystrophy, 
is a disease which is because it's a monogenic disorder so it's easy to study because like diabetes you have so many genes involved it's very hard to study it mutations in air cause this disease it is also called as aps1 and then you have uh, air knockout mouse also interestingly both of them the problem there is one is it's expressed in thymus and the second is there was also extra thymic expression and uh, jin chung's lab which first found air actually they showed in all the immune cells they also found in testes and brain but not in the uterus they had not looked at it and uh, these people have infertility the apcd patients as well as air knockout mouse have 85% infertility it was assumed that it is because of immune problem so i'll skip a little bit of this so that we can go to an interesting data of the act the non immune role of air in the uterus so first of all we had a hard time uh, sequencing air it's a very gc rich region that is why none of the groups worldwide could sequence it so we identified the uh, uterine air variant number 1 we could study its expression and i think you should focus on this that this is the place where the embryo is attaching and this is the primary decidual zone where it is present and so we again used the sirna model and we silenced air and it knocked off pregnancy and when you silence air you can see we have uh, out of four three replicates we had proper silencing and so those were selected for further studies and uh the known air genes are known to take part in distillation addition so we did a microarray and we could find that the key pathways affected are decidualization and addition and therefore we looked at decidualization what is decidualization mm -hmm. the cells of the uterus are converted into nurturing cells or the decidual cells and later they form the placenta it provides nutrition and also acts as a barrier of against uncontrolled trophoblast proliferation so in our in vivo silencing study one interesting thing which we found was first that hoxa 10 which is a key marker of uh, uh decidualization has a air binding motif ig the bp1 also has a air binding motif and all these genes were down regulated Uh, when we did by real time as well as by western and as well as immuno localization so as i said it was present in the primary decidual zone so we expanded our study to a stage where you can see decidua and you could see very good localization of air then we created a model of decidualization where you made the animal with a vasectomized mice inject corn oil in one horn so the horn which you inject corn oil you will see decidualization without an embryo and here there is no decidualization and this is one of the i think one of the best images which we could get which i will show you now so you see in the decidualized you have very good air expression uh, and you can see uh, decidual cell formations good expression and this is the immunofluorescence image so this is non decidualized and this is decidualized you have lot of air expression there and so we said that air is critical to decidualization and this is one of its non immune role this was published in again american journal of reproductive immunology and i am showing you this picture first because i want to show the people behind the work so just now was the one who did all the work in uh this uh, for doc while this chasna and uh, she is now head of uh, genomics in sander and somya the did all the air work and ranjini prashant and shiny were in one ranjini was the one working on estrogen receptor and so now you know normally committees will ask what's the translation you found a molecule it's important Uh, sometimes you might not be doing the translation yourself it's a clinically relevant thing you cannot go and give to a patient interestingly seeing our paper this paper a group in canada a clinical group they thought that okay that could mean that if it is affecting decidualization then apcd syndrome people might have a little preeclampsia kind of 
tendency. So they changed the treatment for these patients and the first ever child from an APCD patient is born in 2019. And in his work, he has quoted our entire work that based on our work, they changed the regimen and the first ever baby from an APCD patient could be born. So I did not do the translation, somebody else did it. But that also I think is very important because you have created a knowledge for somebody else to do that. So uh, estrogen mediated signaling, we talked about dog translocation. So uh, for the student R angle, you all know there's a classical estrogen receptor signaling where estrogen can bind its receptor, which binds ERE. Then you have ligand dependent, you have ERE independent and non-genomic signaling. And I wanted to touch on this work very briefly because it has a lot of importance. Now, most of the people, if you ask a student in an interview, where does epithelial mesenchymal transition occur? They will say cancer. Epithelial mesenchymal transition was first discovered during embryo development and during implantation and pregnancy. And that is why it is called as EMT1. And EMT2 is when it is found in cancer and EMT3 is when it was found in fibrosis. So during embryo implantation and organogenesis, the cells have to go right to different organs. So that happens because of the cells getting converted from epithelial type to mesenchymal type. And so they lose E cadrin, get N cadrin, and they can move and go to another place. And we could show that under influence of estrogen, STAT3 and MCL interact and convert this EMT into the reverse that is MET. And I'll just show you, I think don't worry much about the data, I'll show you a cartoon on that. So what we proposed was something like this. If STAT3 is alone, MCL is alone, it promotes EMT, okay? So epithelial cells get converted into mesenchymal cells. That is important when the organogenesis is happening, or say, I should say even in cancer, when the tumor spreads, the tumor cells get loosened up, they go to another place, but then they have to attach there, right? So that is MET, that is mesenchymal cells acquire epithelial phenotype to go and attach. And this we published in Journal of Cell Science. And this I want to stress another part, when I came to Rajiv Gandhi, Center for Biotechnology, we had a conference where we talked about the non-genomic action on estrogen. And I worked on estrogen regulation of oxygen free radical in a university. We are in a university. So, you know, university work is very important because it's the students who see, the entire student community sees science in universities. And therefore, it's very important that students see what work can you do in a university setup also. So I thought I will bring this in just to inspire you. So I worked on a molecule called as oxygen radical, which has an extra electron. And this is mutated by an enzyme, series of enzymes called as SOD. Unfortunately, till date, the discoverer of SOD has not got a Nobel Prize, while the entire world works on it. And so, so they are generated in cells. You must have all heard that free radicals are very bad and you all have to eat antioxidants, but that's not true. Free radicals are required by our body also. The conversion of, you know, the, you know to convert formation of dioxy ribonucleotides from ribonucleotides, you need superoxide. For phagocytosis, you need superoxide, so killing mechanism. So we actually showed long back that oxygen free radical is very much increased at the time of implantation. And that we suggested affects the membrane fluidity. So the membrane becomes very fluid, probably to allow accommodation of the invading blastocyst. And we could show using an RBC ghost that if you give them superoxide, the membrane becomes fluid. Here, so you see, you increase the dose, you have formation, you, membrane becomes fluid, your formation of a radical called as dienyl radical whose spectral characteristics was given by us only. 
And during implantation, this dienyl radical was high, this blue one. And what we suggested is that it introduces kinks in the molecule so that it occupies more space, making the membrane fluid. This is of long back during my PhD. And then my initial students, along with uh, Dr. Rajesh also, who is there, worked on this. And we could show that NADPH oxidase is increased at the time of implantation which was actually not accepted by many people because it's a free radical, right? So we all think that free radicals are bad. Interestingly, now Jan Brossen's group in 2011 shows that free radicals are required for implantation and decidalization. We published our papers in 1989, 80, 89 to 92. So it has taken more than 20 years for people to, to realize its importance. And so, we could show that estrogen is the one which is modulating this restructuring. I will skip this. I don't know how much time I have. And then another interesting thing, what we found was that the embryos also were generating a lot of superoxide. And that was a very challenging job. Because you have to collect embryos, put them in the electron spin resonance spectrometer and try to measure them. And what we got was embryos generated a lot of superoxide. And we had a very interesting study in those days where you take embryos, unhashed embryos, give them superoxide, it hatches out naturally, and they are viable also. And you can put them back and they attach and you have pregnancy. This again now in 2012 has been proved by another group. And we actually use several antioxidant to show, okay, that it knocks off pregnancy. And this is important. This is present in ketchup. So to all the younger generation who might be eating a lot of ketchup, especially, you know, I've seen outside, I've never seen people like over pizza also, you will add ketchup. Pizza already has tomato sauce, right? So over that also we add ketchup. So this is present and it is, it's a very potent anti antioxidant, but it blocks pregnancy. This is actually an oxygen radical scavenger. It blocks pregnancy, but a hydroxyl radical scavenger doesn't block pregnancy. So I think Rajesh will remember this image is made by Rajesh for uh, his thesis. Uh, he'll be giving a talk later. So if you look at it, our contributions to the field of free radicals, okay, it's not coming, has been vast. In from 1988 on uh, ovarian steroidogenesis, implantation, and iodination of uh, thyroxine. And well, the Nobel Prize goes to Radcliffe recently and Semenza for this uh, showing that free radicals have a positive role. And one of the other molecules critical was nitric oxide. We, it's important in angiogenesis, and we could show that nitric oxide synthase was present during the implantation time. You see these brownish deposits, and in the implanting embryo, probably having a role in angiogenesis during that time. And sildenafil, or what is commonly known as Viagra, is known to improve embryo implantation. Uh, and we were working on polycystic ovarian syndrome and I'll show a little bit how there was a big controversy about role of free radicals in PCOS. And these, these people also along with, just skip it for the students here. Yeah. So they have triad feature that is, uh, they have infrequent menstrual cycle, they have excessive facial hair and they have cysts in the ovary. And they have a lot of other comorbidities like diabetes, cardiovascular dis disorders, obstructive sleep, apnea, depression, as well as endometrial cancer. And along with, like we think that diabetes will become the biggest problem, but along with it, this would be a very massive problem because this will, these women will have later all these problems. So it's classified therefore now as a metabolic syndrome. They also have recurrent miscarriages and that is why my interest was there in them. And so it's now a metabolic syndrome with a lot of socio-endocrine imbalance. And we found that their ENOS levels were low. 
they had low nitric oxide they had an upregulated arginase enzyme now what is this enzyme actually uh, in the cycle of urea you find l arginine is made and l arginine is removed by arginase arginine is required for nitric oxide synthesis through nos so if arginase is high you have low l arginine you will have low nitric oxide so we found elevated arginines in these patients adma another inhibitor of nos has already been reported to be high in pcs patients we found the enzymes which uh, you know elevated prmt and reduced ddh2 lead to an increase adma so therefore we said that an impaired arginine bioavailability or metabolism and nitric oxide synthase affect this and now nitric oxide uh, along with angiogenesis is thought to regulate the immune function by making a class of t regulatory cells which are called as enotrechs so so we looked whether there are decreased t regulatory cells which are, because you need you need more t regulatory cells for the embryo to attach so we found decreased t regulatory cells in pcs patients and we actually tried to correct it by giving interleukin 2 we could correct one arm but still we have to do another treatment and which we are working on currently under the icmr project this work we are very happy that we could get in jcem so i think i will try to stop here because we have a uh, lot of work which is still ongoing so but we could show that an important regulator of t regulate me skip these can bind stat 5b can bind nos promoter and that is how it is uh, regulating tract generation so let me come to the final figure so what we think is that stat 5b along with affecting fox p3 the key master regulator for tract affects nitric oxide by direct binding and we could show by chromatin immunoprecipitation that it binds the uh, the nitric oxide synthase and therefore on one hand it can impact uh, recurrent miscarriages pcos as well as juvenile diabetes so therefore a healthy balance is required in life of free radicals also if you have excess you can have disease if you have less also you can have disease i want to spend 5 minutes to thank all the people who did the work because i i did not do all this work it was all my students who did the work saguna verma was my first student she is now an associate professor at university of hawaii and an expert in zika virus and covid and is featured in science we i had deepak monzi sudhir diksha jaya they are all doing quite well rajesh is a senior scientist in lucknow uh, shiny titus is in us and then these then i have alumni at rgcb and interestingly many of my alumni are now in companies and doing quite well zaiju is an application scientist dr ranjini is with me jasna is the uh, she moved from bioserv some months back and is head of genomics at sander uh, and well there are some uh, uh, philip who is assistant professor uh, betsy is still working with me so uh, so this is a group where i wanted to show you yeah zaiju jasna meera somya and ranjini is there with me and so i think i should skip this this is our current lab the younger generation and you know all this work could not have been possible without the funding support i am very i think privileged to get continuous funding from dbt both extramural and intramural Uh, dst sir brns csir and icmr and all my students had their fellowships my clinical collaborators we could not have done any pcs work with their without them and the staff there the patients themselves who i should also thank actually uh, directors of rgcb dr mr das whom i did not meet in rgcb but i knew him from before uh, and also that he built such a beautiful institute like rajiv gandhi center for biotechnology and dr raghavan thamban 
who followed it up and in his time it got completed he was also instrumental actually in appointing both me and pradeep in rgcb we had never thought that we would be moving down south but he was very keen and therefore we moved down and now we have our current director uh, professor chandrabas narayan uh, i should not forget you know that one second this is like your university campuses so this is the vigyan bhavan where i did my phd and then i uh, had my own lab pradeep also had his own lab and these are these pictures are not very good i think they are old pictures so i tried taking a picture of the lab of the old ones this is rajesh when he was younger and well the influences on me uh, we normally forget to acknowledge our family so i thought i should acknowledge my father who was also the first professor of davv and vice chancellor and i think from childhood i was inspired to become a scientist even maybe two year or three year age i was taught science <laughs> everything was every plant name i was taught since he was a botanist i knew all the plants botanical names not the normal names so and the other person whom i find worth mentioning was we had a vice chancellor and your vice chancellor is not there i would have liked if he was there here right now because this we had several vice chancellors but this vice chancellor was very different he used to tell all of us move grants in crores that was one thing and well the photographs are not very good but we made a very beautiful lab and actually he gave us all the overhead money of funding bodies to make a beautiful lab i thought if your vice chancellor was there i could inspire him to do that here also so in that way he was very different so for him like anybody wanting any funds for science to go get you go and get and you he will give he passed the rule in the executive council that out of the overhead 70% goes to the pi so i thought is worth mentioning these are my many collaborators at rockefeller university sam passed away recently and he was involved in what we all call now the abortion pill so i worked on the abortion pill development with him there and this is jin shang obviously pradeep is there a younger pradeep is there and and with jin shang i worked on diabetes and uh, and then i thought i should thank my family so my mother who left her uh, career in dancing for her three daughters i think has to be given more thanks because she sacrificed her entire career she used to be the secret all india secretary for dance in her days and my three daughters used to wait till 8 30 9 o'clock alone in the house looking when is the car coming when are the parents coming back home so thank you all thank you dr malni for the wonderful presentation if you have any questions or clarification please you feel free to talk to dr malni privately and get it done thank you now we will move to the next session before that an announcement the <coughs> the society as i told in the beginning awards best paper prizes for both oral and poster presentation by students Uh, is very important only for students we give the you know, not for faculty members or senior scientists and there will be judges sitting in this crowd invincibly and they will be assessing your uh, presentation the uh, criteria for selection of uh, papers for award will be first novelty in your uh, research and then quality of your research your presentation style and the quality of the ppt slides and discussion conclusion and finally and importantly defense you have to answer the questions raised by the audience so this will be done during the course of the presentation so if a oral presentation since we are not able to identify clearly any faculty member if there are any faculty member please tell me in person or you have a uh, faculty member or a such scientist we are this is meant for young students to encourage them thank you 
yeah post doctorals also we are not uh, only phd students and post graduate students we are uh, including okay so i think we'll get started with the first uh, scientific session uh, just a few things before i introduce the uh, chair and co-chair for this session. The invited speaker talks, we have three invited speaker talks and three oral presentations in each session. The invited speaker talks are for 20 minutes, so 15 minutes for the talk and five minutes for discussion. And then oral presentations given by students are uh, for uh, 10 minutes, followed by a two minute discussion for a total of 12 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna hand this buzzer over to the chair and co-chair. So at 15 minutes, I request them to make a sound such as this. So it alerts the speaker to wind up their talk. And at 20 minutes, one more time, which means that they've run out of time. And you know, for the judges, it's important that they know because they, they, the times have been already given to the students and the speaker. So, so it's just as important to deliver their lectures within time. Because if they give, if somebody's given extra time, they may be able to deliver more information. So it's probably important that they consider that as well. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, so we have, we have a mic that will go around at the end of each session, uh, at each talk. So Elvin over there, he has a mic. If you have questions, please raise your hand and call him, get his attention and he will be able to come to you and you can ask your questions. Okay. Um, so right now, I'd like to introduce the chair and co-chair for our uh, first session. So the chair for our first session is Professor Ramachandran A.V. I request him to come onto stage. He's a former professor and dean uh, from MS University of Baroda and currently uh, working at uh, Navrachna University. Our co-chair for the session is Dr. Rajesh Kumar Jha. He's a principal scientist working at CSIR Central Drug Research Institute. So there's a mic over there for you to introduce the speakers. And uh, I hand over the session and the... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So we now start with session number one. We start with business for the society. We have uh, three speakers in this session. The first speaker is Dr. Ashutosh Haldar. His talk will be on polycystic ovarian syndrome and overview. Dr. Ashutosh Haldar belongs to the Department of Reproductive Biology. AIMS New Delhi is an MD, DNB, DM. He works he's in the field of medical genetics. And his areas of research are reproductive endocrinology, reproductive genetics, and reproductive biology. And uh, he has been awarded Dr. Subhash Mukherjee Oration Award 2019 and Dr. N.L. Murgal Oration Award in 2021. And he's also an ICMO International Senior Scientist Awardee. I Good welcome morning. Dr. Alder and invite you to deliver presentation. Thank you, sir. First of all, I'd like to thank organizer and society of SRBCE and uh, my dear audience, seniors and juniors. So today, uh, time is very short and topic is very complicated. So I'll be delivering a little bit on polycystic ovary syndrome and overview. So if you see polycystic ovary syndrome, how name changes over time. Still, it's not fixed, still controversy. See, first, Valserini in 1721 described this condition as a large white shiny ovary. 
Then Chedu in 1844, French person, Valserini is Italian, sclerocystic or fibrocystic ovary. Rokitansky for the modified cystic degeneration of ovary. Bullius called it as a hyperthicosis of ovary. Maglim, microcystic ovary. 1935, this is a first scientific description given by Stein Leventhal. And after that name came as a Stein Leventhal syndrome. Then polycystic ovary, Stein syndrome alone. When Leventhal left Stein, the syndrome name as a Stein, Stein syndrome. Then sclerocystic polycystic ovary by Davis, polycystic ovary syndrome by Kittel, polycystic ovarian disease by Ivan and Riley. Then polycystic ovary disease, Lambert, 59. Then polycystic ovarian syndrome, 1980. But present consensus is polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Polycystic ovary syndrome, present consensus, but you get publication as a polycystic ovarian syndrome also. So it's still not acceptable last classification. How the disease described initially? Valserini in 1721, Italy, first described that um, as a case report, the disorder, uh, obese woman with infertility and large white shiny ovary as like a pigeon egg. Then Cheru, French, 1844, described that fibrous and sclerotic ovary with hydropic follicles, sclerocystic ovary, followed by from German, Bullius, they are very good in histopathology. So hyperthicosis of the ovary, after histopathological examination of the ovary of these patients. stein leventhal syndrome is the first clinical description scientifically of polycystic ovary. Then Ian comes in 1970, linked with LH and high testosterone. So this is Stein and Leventhal syndrome. Left side is Stein. He was the professor that time in Chicago um, University in a guiding ups college. And Leventhal was that time an intern. And they published, first presented in a conference of um, American Association. Uh, this is probably uh, North American um, conference in Seattle uh, in 1934, and they published this paper in 1935 as amenorrhea associated with bilateral polycystic ovaries. And they presented seven cases, Leventhal presented the uh, series of cases, seven cases, all with infertility and enlarged ovary. And five had amenorrhea, two had uh, oligomenorrhea, hirsutism was in four cases, small breast and small uterus in three and five cases and five conceived, conceived after wedge resection in two, three years time, and all after, I think, five, six years time, and all resumed menstruation. So their presentation main characteristic was secondary amenorrhea or irregular periods and sterility, bilateral polycystic symmetric enlarged ovaries. And they also mentioned that you have to exclude normal amount um, um, CH and premature ovarian failure by 17 ketosteroid and FSH. This is a very um, uh, important uh, exclusion criteria one should. And bilateral cystic ovaries results from abnormalities in hormonal stimulation, that also they mentioned in that. So, uh, but um, in this uh, description, they never mentioned hyperandrogenemia as a major importance. Although it's uh, uh, found in more than 50% of cases, but it was not a major presentation features, not in, um, uh, placed in title or discussion, leading to criticism later by Dutoit. Dutoit is, uh, I think, um, um, all, uh, from Netherlands, um, PhD student, and he was uh, doing a PhD on uh, polycystic ovary, menstrual disturbance and hirsutism. And uh, he um, mainly propagated that uh, testosterone should be a major, hyperandrogenemia is a major feature. This uh, then uh, diagnostic criteria, there are three, uh, three so, um, um, societies, they give the criteria. First came in 1990, NIH 90 criteria, then Rotterdam 2003 criteria, and Androgen uh, Excess PCOS Society 2006 criteria. Uh, NIH, uh, they did not consider polycystic ovary as a criteria, only hyperandrogenism and anovulation. Rotterdam criteria, 
they have polycystic ovary along with previous two and any two is required for the diagnosis and androgen excess PCOS, they said clinical hyperandrogen must be there. Then ovarian dysfunction in the form of uh, either uh, menstrual disturbance or polycystic ovarian disease and both the criteria you need. And, uh, but um, NIH 1990 criteria is modified in 2012 and they accepted Rotterdam criteria, but they um, said that you have to um, divide the cases into different phenotypes, phenotype A, B, C, D. A means all three criteria is there. B means first two criteria. C is first and last criteria and D is last two criteria. And uh, 2015, not 16, uh, publication was in 16. Uh, 2015, um, this society also accepted Rotterdam criteria, but they have not um, 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 advised for phenotypic uh, um, clarification. So presently, we use um, NIS 2012 criteria, that is a Rotterdam criteria with phenotypic uh, classification. Uh, this is very important because um, phenotype-wise, the cases are uh, not um, same. It's not moving now. It's not moving. Okay, so NIS uh, phenotypic classification, the phenotype already I've described and these are the criteria. But if you see the um, different society criteria, they never mentioned about the what should be the androgen level cutoff value, what should be the um, um, your uh, um, clinical hyperandrogenism or biochemical hyperandrogenism criteria because this is a variation of androgen level as well as clinical hyperandrogenism, FGS code is depends on ethnicity and uh, type of test you have done. It's very complicated, so nobody has recommended. If you, uh, this is a case, 18 years old, and if you see here, primary amazonia, FGS code means hyperandrogenism, clinical, ultrasound is uh, polycystic ovary, all three are there, and uh, by present criteria, it's a phenotype A. And AMH is more than 25, it's very high. Dihydrate and insulin sulfate normal. LH versus ratio a little bit higher, borderline. Insulin normal, cortisol normal. 17 hydroxy progesterone is uh, also normal. All are normal except AMH and clinical three criteria. So this is a case of pure PCOS phenotype A. This is another side. You have a primary amenorrhea. FGS code is uh, clinical hyperandrogenism. Ultrasound is normal, so no PCOS. So it fits with uh, PCOS phenotype B. But if you see, AMH is normal. Dihydropion is high. LHFSS ratio is norm, uh, normal. Then insulin uh, normal. Cortisol also normal. 70 is very high. Uh, it's uh, more than the detection uh, limit of the lab and others are normal, except blood pressure is borderline. So this is a case, phenotype B PCOS, but high 17 hydroxy progesterone, AMH is normal. So this is not a case of PCOS actually. This is a CAH compensated case. So you have to distinguish this condition. This is very often, this is a classical CAH because 17 hydroxy more than 200. Androgen level is very high. I think two over near three. So you must exclude these cases, but milder cases will come very often. That exclusion is very difficult without uh, genome genomics. So, we are working for the last five, six years on PCOS. I'll just uh, describe briefly over whatever our work. We have um, three extramural projects and one PhD student is already awarded. Another PhD student is uh, working on genomics, etiological factors as well as PCOS, mainly genomics and epigenomics. So biomarkers, androgens, the various androgens, then AMH, LH, 17 hydroxy progesterone, NAVN B, leptin, insulin, HOMA IR, uh, inflammatory markers, AH, BPA, and also thalate, DDT, KIS, peptin, melatonin, etc. We are working for all this. Last one is uh, work is just initiated, no results will be presented. So, androgen, these are the androgens, five androgens we have tried. And what we found that testosterone, because of uh, it's a very um, uh, FDA approved kit we are using, um, our uh, platform, but uh, it's um, whatever recommended in different pa um, um, papers and what we got is variable. 
and uh, this is a ROC carp, um, and we found the best uh, association with dihydrotestosterone. Although dihydrotestosterone is a local hormone, mainly in the skin, blood level will not correlate to local level, but even in blood level, we found the best ROC with the best sensitivity specificity. So probably this uh, can be, and it's very simple to measure, and uh, probably this can be a place in diagnosis of biochemical hyperandrogenism in India. The summary of these androgens, uh, mean DST value was 584 in uh, cases versus control to 57, it's uh, very highly significant. And um, area under ROC curve was 0.89 in total cases and 0.95 in phenotype. Rate. Anything 0.9 or more is a diagnostic level marker. DST can be considered as best available biomarker of hyperentropy in PCOS in our setup. And uh, it's a, uh, this paper is accepted in Journal Clinical Diagnosis and Research 2021. The DST as a market to publish in a very good international journal is very difficult because nobody is accepting uh, other than test, uh, free testosterone or FAI. And FAI is a difficult and free testosterone uh, method is um, very difficult to and you need LCMS for the accuracy, which is not possible in most of the places. So another marker is AMH. Uh, we found AMH um, 0.97 as a um, you know, ROC value, uh, area under carb. So this is a very good marker, means uh, ideal marker probably I can say. And this is in total test 0.93 and phenotype 0.97. And the sensitivity is uh, 8 to 2% um, and uh, phenotype EA 91% when specificity is over 90%. And all the among all the markers, AMH is the best marker we found. And probably this uh, you see in, uh, that uh, CAs versus PCOS. This single test can distinguish. And we also um, um, did multivariable um, um, logistic uh, analysis, and we found that um, uh, this is the AMH is the best uh, marker, uh, very highly significant, and that can be used as a diagnostic marker. Testing also good, DST also good. Summary: high value, more than point, uh, 5.2 nanogram per ml, uh, is seen in over 85 percent of cases. Not affected by age or uh, reproductive cycles and or BMI or hirsutism, that is a uh, sperm and correlation ratio. So this is a very good marker. Even in androgen, you see in CAH case, um, uh, despite 2.8 AMH was normal. So it's not affected even with androgen. Then prediction model also shows that this is a um, excellent marker at diagnostic range and best available biomarker of PCOS at this moment. And this paper uh, is under revision two by IGMR. IGMR takes a long time. And bisphenol A, we found bisphenol A is quite um, commonly associated uh, with uh, PCOS. High level observed in 64% uh, cases by ROC carb, but if you would take the main plus uh, two standard deviation, it's below uh, 50%. AUC or AUC is 0.84, it's not bad. Specificity and sensitivity, 90% um, um, of specificity, sensitivity is 64% uh, with uh, total and 65% in phenotype A. So phenotype was probably but not difference. And the sperm and analysis significantly correlation between BP and androgens level. This is one of the problem. Then logistic analysis, patients with high BP level have eight times more PCOS chance. Epigenetic status in PCOS. Um, we did a whole genome um, methylation um, ELISA test and we uh, we found that um, the mostly hypermethylated and uh, very few hypomethylated. And these are the uh, comparisons we did with um, um, uh, microarray, uh, methylation microarray, and we found one gene, CCL4, uh, L1, with um, uh, comparison is um, uh, control versus hypomethylation. Then we found two promoters. Uh, those are mainly RNA, long uh, non-coding RNA genes regulators. And uh, another one is, so this initial findings, we did whole genome sequencing for not IFA, 35 cases. We found some of the genes like ghrelin gene in five cases, uh, pathogenic variant, UCP1, UCP2, 
uh, in one one case and uh, insulin receptor substrates one in one case and um, SIP group. We found five in the steroid biosynthetic pathway um, pathogenic variant in uh, five cases, uh, three with SIP21, star uh, in uh, two cases, uh, five, six cases rather, and um, uh, POR is in one case. So um, before doing whole genome, uh, whole exam sequencing to exclude the biosynthetic, steroid biosynthetic pathway problem is very difficult. These are the different, and these are our publications on this PCOS. Thank you very much. I think I'm on time. Thank you, Dr. Halder. The talk is open for discussion. If there are any questions, we can take a few questions. Yep. Hello. Uh, you have done exome sequencing. We identify variants of different uh, G. In the same patient, did you correlate the what kind of variations were there? Any relationship or association between these genes? So, uh, this um, uh, whole exam sequencing done only in phenotype A cases. Only phenotype A cases means all three cardinal features were there. Okay. Uh, they, they, did you, I mean, could you able to establish any kind of relationship between or associate between the genes which have mutations? in that particular, uh, are variants in the particular patients? Any any um, kind of yes, message you can those, bring out? Those details I have, I have not uh, exact mutation. Uh, we have, we have written a paper on that. Um, details is um, not given here, but uh, it's all pathogenic variant. We have taken only pathogenic variant. Pathogenic variant and um, I think um, for SIP group, mostly homozygous or compound heterozygous mutation variant. And in other um, group, um, they are also, I think, uh, mostly compound heterozygous. And it's a uh, one uh, protein coding gene uh, with um, uh, um, uh, nucleotide change leading to change in protein also. And um, it's not mentioned here because of uh, space and time also. So it's not detailed described, but we have submitted one of this paper. Any other question? No? Yeah, the Mali. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, wonderful presentation. So I have one query. The DHC and AMH at what stage of PCOS does one start seeing a See, these are all cross-sectional study yes. because all referred yes. suspected yes. cases. See, uh, this is a very homogeneous group of patients. We have more than 300 referral cases as a PCOS. But when we recheck in our laboratory, we have all facilities and major, th these are maximum 137 cases we have um, presented here. The rest we removed because for diagnosis of PCOS, you need ultrasound, targeted ultrasound. Most of the ultrasound they do from outside is non-targeted ultrasound. And nobody will mention the probe intensity because if it is a 10 megahertz probe, small clinic, they will have five megahertz probe. Their diagnostic title is different. That will be 10, ML size or more, and number of follicles 12 or more, one or both over you. But if you have a 10 megahertz um, uh, ultrasound probe, it goes to 20, more than 24 follicles per over you need. Because t uh, 12 is commonly seen in mostly in most of the patients. So those things are not mentioned. So until unless we do ourselves, we cannot include whether which category will. So we remove those cases. Hmm? That I cannot comment because it's all a full flows in cases. But yes, um, I think around th one third of the cases are um, between 17 to um, 19 years. So those are early cases, but 
yes um, um, i think early the earliest thing will be see phenotype d and phenotype a to me is totally different things phenotype d they are normal weight hardly any high bmi their insulin level is little higher than the phenotype a and um, their um, amh level is highest and uh, than any other phenotype so phenotype d probably um, is a different category of pcos than phenotype a or b and uh, phenotype d uh, amh could be very early stage but in very to what Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have wonderful things. Uh, in fact, all the audience should focus to have the time utilized for interacting with the speakers because this session has very important aspect of the conference where we have molecular technology as well as the you know, uh, germ cells based uh, molecular signaling, which will be very, very, uh, you know, effective to take your things forward. Maybe also have the interaction possibility. So to move on, the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Pradeep Kumar Ji, uh, uh, he's known to me since many years. I don't want to count the years. And we have gracefully aged. Maybe he's uh, uh, much younger than me, definitely. And uh, not to mention, uh, he's a very uh, 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 versatile person in terms of, uh, you know, speaking, interacting with students, and I am one of them, and I'm butting, butting off and leading uh, his uh, torch to Syria, right? Uh, one of my mentor, Dr. Marling, was over here. And uh, uh, he received his PhD from DABV and uh, moved to uh, Rockefeller, where he has a tremendous job in securement patent as well. And uh, he works on uh, germline uh, stem cells, uh, division and differentiation. And uh, he has uh, shown uh, you know, marvelous contributions in that aspect. Not only this, he has many committees uh, at DBT, CSIR, so we keep interacting. But though uh, the time limit, I would stop over here. And uh, moreover, uh, he also got one uh, award, uh, which is very notable from DBT, it's a National Bioscience Award. So with this uh, very brief, very, let me say very uh, quick short, I would like to request Dr. Uh, uh, Kumar to have podium for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. Um, Honorable uh, Professor AVR and uh, our student Rajesh. Um, it's uh, always uh, great to come to SRBC, it's more like coming home. Meet the friends, and last year we couldn't meet eye to eye, but anyway, this time at least being in the hybrid mode, we can meet some of you guys. So um, let me get on to the business of introducing this topic of uh, uh, speaking about this molecule called cyclin M1 in spermatogenesis. So uh, there are some students in the audience and um, we do know that this uh, step called fertilization, it's all about the fusion of this one cell, sperm from the guy and the oocyte uh, uh, cell, both are haploid cells. So the oocyte comes to the lady and it makes one zygote, that's again a diploid cell, has half the genome from the father, half the genome from the mother. So that way, it's not a clone, it's a unique individual. The sperm are produced in the testis and um, in the male body this is the only place where diploid cells become haploid and making haploid cells will be very necessary to reproduce sexually so uh, testis in the male and ovary in the female are the two places where cells divide and ultimately differentiate to produce haploid cells um, so the uh, task of producing this haploid cell is through the process we call as uh, spermatogenesis so the sperm are produced in the testis, then they have to, they are still not ready to move. These are motile cells, by the way. So the cells produced in this region of the, the male body will have to pass through this complex network of tubular structure to attain the capability to move and also to fuse with the oocyte, but otherwise it will not be able to do either of the things. So this is the kind of classical textbook diagram about the sperm development. The initiator cell is this spermatogonium, call it like that. They can 
uh, self renew to produce their own copies, they also can differentiate. So this cell has an option either to get into this pathway of making its own copies or differentiate a bit to produce type A spermatogonium, it can become type B spermatogonium, then it becomes primary spermatocyte. And now there is no walking back, it has to go forward to produce the sperm. So till here, till the primary spermatocyte, these cells are all deployed, differentiated at various levels. And then from here on, you know, they are haploid cells. So this is, this is the, the major event that produces the haploid cells. And we work on almost all these steps. Uh, to look, we look at the self renewal. We look at the spermatogonial cells, uh, the type A or uh, B spermatogonium, whether they are pluripotent or multipotent. How do they differentiate in a sequential, stepwise fashion? So multiple steps of differentiation. What happens at each of the stages, and then how it gets into meiosis. So we call this thing as meiotic drive. The cell gets into meiosis, and this meiosis had been a problem because you know from the school onwards, our teachers teach us about uh, cell division, cell cycle, you know, mitosis. You have G zero, G one, G two mitosis. So the cell that was dividing very comfortably through mitosis then decides to get out of that get into the differentiation pathway to produce uh, these haploid cells. So I happened to ask my teacher, school teacher about meiosis. Why is it that, you know, other cells cannot divide through meiosis? She told me, Pradeep, just, uh, you know, listen to me, read what is there in the textbook and uh, write it, we will give you a mark. Otherwise, you know, you will fail. I did not fail, but the thing is that question was there, how does meiosis happen? So this is what we had been um, carrying forward. And then there are other steps about, uh, these two cells, haploid cells coming together to fuse. This is a terminally differentiated cell. This also is a terminally differentiated cell. They, they have very distinct fate. These cells die off in a normal situation. These cells also die. And males produce 200 million sperm almost every single day and uh, all of them die. And you may have this lucky two cells, you know, in case you have two kids, I mean, if you already have two kids or if you plan to have two kids, you may, you would have produced just those two cells which had the you know, fortune of meeting an oocyte. Similarly, a lady in her lifetime might produce 200 uh, uh, you know, uh, oocytes, mature oocytes. And uh, again, one or two will get the chance to get fertilized. The rest of them uh, die off. So that is the normal fate. And once they fuse, these two terminally differentiated cells make a totipotent cell that's amazing, almost in no time. So, uh, well, we won't talk about this gamete interaction. Um, when we know that the guys produce a lot of cells and the ladies produce one oocyte um, every month, 15% of the couple trying to have a baby uh, you know, don't get it the easy way out. They reach this uh, you know, ART art clinics, assisted reproductive technology clinics one or later, and uh, they would uh, do all the kind of tests. Um, there could be female factor, I won't talk about it. Then there is this male factor. Uh, it can be psychosomatic disorder where, you know, the guy is not able to inseminate the lady. We are not going to talk about that. Spermatogenesis related problem is something that uh, we are interested in. The fertilization related events, yes, we are interested. And also the early development related problems. Uh, so these three uh, reasons in case they are there associated with the male, we go after that. So the doctor runs a test and would say them they will have all kinds of guidelines and WHO 2010 the guidelines are the ones which are followed right now. So based on that, the doctor might tell that, oh, this individual is oligosuspermic. That does mean that he produces a little less number of sperm, maybe not the normal number, you know, it's less than 15 million sperm. Or they call it asthenosuspermia, would mean that, that you know, 40% of the cells are immortile. Teratosuspermia means only 4% of them are normal looking sperm. So it's like the number is less, mortality is less, and um, they're not that good looking. They're not very, very handsome cells. They have a little abnormally shaped configuration. So they are the kinds of reasons the doctor might say, uh, you know, is behind uh, your infertility. Um, and then there are all kinds of techniques for assisting these people. Uh, that's all fine. But, um, you know, if the sperm are not there, uh, it's a real problem. Doctor cannot do anything. And Semen analysis is just descriptive. You know, you need one cell to you know fertilize the oocyte. You don't need four million sperm. So a guy with four million count is called oligosuspermic, and if that is going to be called as a reason for infertility, I might say that it will not making much sense. Similarly, if forty percent abnormal sperm are there, so what? Sixty percent. So the semen analysis that the doctor does normally may not be uh, the you know 
hinting at the real reason for male factor infertility. So, because we know that uh, many of these things are done by uh, uh, the proteins on the sperm, the sperm on the protein will interact with the oocyte at multiple levels. We ran a differential display proteomics. So we look at the proteome of the sperm from fertile males and that from the infertile males. There could be a lot of common molecules present in both the guys, the sperm from both these kinds of uh, individuals. And then there are something present only in the fertile guys not present the infertile people. Similarly, there could be some proteins present only in the infertile people, uh, which would be absent in the fertile people. So we are specifically interested in those kinds of molecules which are differentially displayed. So we have a list, not readable, but you don't have to read that. So we focused on a uh, bunch of molecules because of various reasons. One thing is, uh, you know, when you have uh, several molecules, 250 plus molecules in the population, it's not that one guy has 250 proteins absent. One guy may have one protein absent. The second guy may, second patient may have a second protein absent. Like that in the population that we studied, we identified a little over 250 proteins, which are differentially displayed. Then the questions, we are funded by DBT and DBT has its own ways of looking at it. They will tell, okay, Pradeep, just take one molecule and just work on it and uh, die with it. And you say, no, you don't want to do that. You may have to look at a couple of molecules. So we uh, did shortlist a couple of molecules based on a bunch of uh, uh, logical parameters. And I would uh, talk about the cycline M1 protein. So this is a uh, percent uh, in the brain and also in the testes. Interestingly, many of the proteins present in the testes are there in the brain. So uh, though there is no, no commonality in the function between testes and the brain, but there is huge amount of gene expression similarities between testes and brain. This protein, which is we call us, we later you know, named as cycling M1 because it did have a, a, a very clear uh, cycling box. So, which is uh, there in cycling B1, cycling between all the cyclines. So, because this cycline box is present in this molecule, we call it a cycline like protein, CLP. That was a name that we gave in the beginning. Later, when it went to the protein nomenclature, so A, B, C, D, E, F, D, all the way up, up to L, the thing was there. So, they have given uh, the name cycline M. It has four variants, so M1, 2, 3, and 4. And this is the sequence, and wherever I have put this little line, yeah, which is a methionine, that's a potential start codon. So it has a couple of uh, very potential start codons, all with one single stop codon. So you can be read in multiple ways. You can, you know, the system can read it from the first start codon or the second start codon, possibly on the, of, based on, the, I mean, starting from the third start codon. How that is regulated is not known. We are trying to work on that. So that, that's the gene and uh, uh, 11 in, uh, exons, uh, approximately 2.1 KB gene, uh, very heavily present in the testis and uh, brain. Um, so th this, is the, this is the brain and that's the testis. And this is the protein level expression. Uh, this is the brain and that's the testis. Um, so um, this is expressed from, you know, from uh, we had to go back to the mouse and we identified the mouse uh, homologue. It's present in, in the mouse, the neonatal mouse of one week of age here, there is no meiosis that has started. So week one, two, three, four, five, week one expression is very high and you have the better acting as a control, a loading control. So it's there everywhere, but uh, you know, the week one, even pre-meiotic phase, the expression is very high. Um, and if you look at the gene expression, these cells that you see over here, uh, you know, one, one circle of cells, uh, they predominantly express this cycle number. They happen to be the cells which are the progenitor cells or the spermatogonial stem cells. Uh, to uh, convince you, here is this image where uh, these cells, uh, so uh, one of the channel, the green channel, um, I believe is uh, you know, C-kit and the, red the green channel is cycline M1 and the red channel is a C-kit. So C-kit positive cells, wherever you see the red color over here, that is green also. So just look at this, uh, you know, uh, the close up. So these are the C-kit positive cells to show that they are stem cells, they are cycline M1 positive. Similarly, the OC34 positive cells are positive for cycling M1. So it did, uh, you know, uh, boil down to this point that the germline stem cell, the stem cells in the testes are the ones which express cycling M1. So we took them out uh, through cell sorting. We put them in the culture. Uh, it did a little lot of manipulation. So these are uh, the cells which will make the germ cells, which will make the sperm eventually. But you take them out, put in the culture, uh, give a bunch of treatments. Finally, they forget, almost forget that they are germ cells. They make ES like bodies, absolute ES like bodies from neonatal mouse and also from the adult mouse. They will make very, very beautiful ES like structure. We checked the, it's positive for GIFRI, integrin alpha 6, alkaline phosphate acidin, and all to show that they are very much like uh, ES cells, embryonic stem cells. It's more like converting 
a germ cell into a somatic cell. That's never what we wanted to do. That's a different story. But these cells can be reprogrammed to produce somatic cells, and they can make the moment you, you withdraw a couple of reagents from the culture medium, uh, they differentiate into embryoid body like structures. So these are like embryoid bodies. These are not embryos. They are bodies generated from the testes, uh, the germ cells from the testes. And they are positive uh, for this, uh, you know, the markers for stem cells uh, in the beginning. And later, the, when you, uh, you know, induce differentiation, they are positive for the AFP alpha feta protein. That's been nested to show that, you know, you have ectodermal, mesodermal, and then uh, endodermal lineages present in those bodies to show that they are, uh, you know, now differentiated cells, uh, more like, uh, you know, embryoid bodies. And uh, over here, if you see, uh, so we went on to a germline stem, uh, germ cell, li um, uh, what do you say, um, um, uh, available in the market, uh, mouse derived um, cell line, GC1 SPG, that also expresses cycle M1. And you try to uh, stimulate it with retinoic acid uh, or stimulate by retinoic acid. Obviously, you know, the striate uh, is expressed to show that, you know, the, the retinoic acid signal is working. And the moment you try to differentiate the GC1 cell, which is a spermatogonial cell line, uh, immortalized cell. So the moment you give retinoic acid to stimulate striate expression, the cycle number one is downregulated. That does mean that if you try to differentiate the germline stem cell using retinoic acid, which is a, an inducer of differentiation of the germ cell, uh, cycle number one comes down. So then came the question, okay, well, all right, we know week one after the birth uh, in, the, in the mouse case, uh, even before meiosis, the cycle number is expressed. At what stage exactly does it start? So we wanted to go back in uh, timeline to see when, when will it start? So this is like week one onwards. I showed this image earlier also. So we want to walk back uh, because all these cells originate from the primordial germ cells. Uh, through gonocyte to the spermatogonial stem cells. So we were standing over here at this point of time, we wanted to walk back. So uh, we initiated a program, a collaborative program uh, through a, uh, you know, uh, an exchange of leadership of one of my students. So we uh, looked at the PGCs, uh, um, well, uh, the color is not very, very clear. This is the cycle M1. So this is, uh, uh, you know, the embryonic, uh, e, like this is E5 and E8, E9, E10, E11, the embryonic 12, this is embryonic 13. So these are all from the embryos. So if you look at it, so we have cycling M1 in this, uh, this is blue color, the rest are M2, M3, M4. So this one, this is the place where you could see the cycling M1 expression for the first time. But unfortunately, this is a female embryo, not a male embryo. In male embryo, even on E13, the embryonic the 13 cycle M1 is not expressed. So uh, cycle M1 expression in the male possibly happens after embryonic the 13, but before the first week of, uh, uh, you know, uh, neonatal life. And my student will have a presentation, yeah, uh, to, to talk about it uh, further. Uh, we uh, overexpress cycle M1 uh, in the cells. We also silence um, uh, cycle M1. I, it did affect over silencing of cycle M1 did um, affect the cell cycle. Uh, there was more accumulation of, you know, uh, this is the G1 phase, G1 came down, S and G2M uh, increased. So it's a regulator of the cell cycle. Um, so we have uh, this paper published in um, Biology of Reproduction. Um, we went and uh, now the thing is how cycle M1 experience is regulated in the testis is what we had been working on for the last two, three years. So we cloned the putative promoter. We scanned up all the kinds of binding sites available on the putative promoter. And um, we know that the GDNF, uh, you know, enhances the expression, uh, the, the promoter activity in the reporter system. Um, and okay, that, that's what is shown over here. C18-4, this another cell line which behaves a little different. GC1, this responds better than uh, GC1-SPG. Um, um, then, um, well, um, so the one molecule, TDP43, another molecule that we have interest in is a negative regulator of TDP for uh, cycle number one expression in the testes. Um, so uh, we also know right now that, uh, you know, there is a, a histone modification for the, the uh, promoter region, uh, the putative promoter region that we have cloned does have a CPG island. We know that that area does bind, um, uh, does, uh, bind H3, uh, the histone, you know, H3K7 modified. So we tried to use an inhibitor and th that did inhibit the you know, expression of uh, this gene, the, the promoter activity that we know that H3K9, uh, uh, you know, methylation is very much necessary for the expression of this gene. Um, so with this, I would conclude right now, this is not a completed story. The, uh, the research, uh, the experiments are still going on. 
we i would right now conclude that the in, uh, the impaired expression of cycle one is associated with impaired spermatogenesis in men so that way we can possibly use it as one of the markers in case uh, you know we want to do that and cycle one appears to be a germline stem cell determinant um, as it's expressed in cells which are oc 34 and secret positive and the proximal promoter of the cycle one has been characterized and we know that cycle one expression is regulated by gdnf retinoic acid and mec anti dp43 and cycle one promoter has SDK9 occupancy, which regulates the expression of uh, the, this gene epigenetically. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we are. Uh, thank you so much. And these are the people uh, who contributed. Uh, so Malini definitely is my uh, collaborator. Um, so uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, my good friend, who was in the University of Virginia, who moved to PPI, uh, to um, uh, Illinois, uh, is an active collaborator. Uh, doing a part of the studies, Jin Chong in University of Florida, and Harry Lice um, from MRC London. Uh, uh, we have uh, some business about the, uh, you know, the new the uh, uh, prenatal um, uh, mouse uh, embryos. Sharad Uma Indu Devi Nomesh Sushya did all the uh, promoter activity studies, and uh, you know other people contributed in uh, germline stem cell culture. Thank you. I can take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. The talk is open for a question. We have time enough for just one or two questions, short and sweet, and to the point. Are there any questions? Uh, Dr. Pradeep, yeah. I did not get the point that the cycling M1 expressing both the uh, oogenesis and spermatogenesis are only in spermatogenesis. Um, so it's present in the oog site, whether I'm, but I'm not sure whether that has anything to do with the uh, oogenesis or not. We have not studied that. But uh, the E18 embryo did express uh, cycle M1, but the, unfortunately that animal was a female. So beyond that, we don't know anything about it, but I don't work on oogenesis. So, so that's an open question, yeah. Hello, sir, it was a wonderful talk. In fact, I would like to know the role of, did you check for role of ER alpha and ER bar, which plays an important role in cell proliferation. So, where this uh, uh, work has been wonderfully done by Cario and Hess. We, we tried to see whether cyclin one expression is regulated using the GC1 SPG, the germline, uh, you know, the immortalized germ cells. We tried to stimulate it with testosterone. We tried to, you know, give estrogen. Uh, in culture, 17 bit asteroid in the culture, there was no response at all. Yes, yeah, sir. There was I, no response. I, I do agree with yeah. you, but in vitro uh, system is entirely different from in vivo. I, is, I understand that. Yeah. The coordinated yeah. factors. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. In vivo, we have not checked it at all. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Uh, hello, sir. Very wonderful talk. Uh, so, sir, the retinoic acid is actually inhibiting your cycline M1. So, I just wanted to know that in the in vivo, uh, when does this triad get expressed so that both can be regulated? Um, so, uh, uh, the retinoic acid expression of the retinoic acid uh, regulated changes in the testis happens in a pulsative fashion all the time. So, some cells will have, uh, you know, the sensitivity to retinoic acid. It will express the receptors, they will get into the differentiation pathway. So suppose you have 20,000 cells in the testis, or germ cells in the testis, maybe there could be 100 of them, which may express retinoic acid receptor, RIR. Those cells will re respond to retinoic acid. So in a time sequence, there are waves. So in a 38 day cycle in mouse, or maybe 60 days in human being, there's always a phase where some cells are responsive to retinoic acid, but not all the cells. So the thing, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, in a system, multiple cells coexist, out of which some of them would be responding to retinoic acid, but many of them will not be responding to retinoic acid. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. I can discuss it later. Oh, yeah. Actually, I just okay. wanted to know about the, uh, like, is it like at three days postpartum, the retinoic acid is actually getting expressed in the mouse. So at that time, your cycling would be very high. Is it something to do with that type? Uh, I will come back to you on yes, that. Yes. So, so I mean, it's not that simplistic. I, mean, I would talk to you yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think you can continue the discussion later and because there's no time. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Give us thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Thank you. Bye-bye.
the third speaker of the session is dr kanakaraj palinandi his talk will be on dna nucleotide aptamer a12 selectively binds to abcg2 protein in breast cancer stem cells dr kanakaraj is an assistant professor at the sarum institute of science and technology he has a phd and his area of work is breast and pancreatic cancer and he has got a best presentation aacr travel award dr kanakaraj Thank you very much uh, for the nice inter introduction. I would like to thank uh, 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 Professor Shwanadpa uh, and also Professor Malini for providing wonderful opportunity uh, to present my research work over here, uh, and also thank my teachers uh, uh, shaping out uh, to do research in this uh, field. I spoke to my collaborator doctor. He's my friend. Um, uh, he's working on, he's uh, doing a lot of surgeries, breast cancer surgeries. And nowadays uh, the breast cancer incidence is higher because of the uh, lifestyle changes, a lot of uh, uh, problem in the women. So uh, that could be the reason the young women uh, develop their breast cancer nowadays. Um, uh, that's what we are working uh, right now in the uh, abdominal-based uh, diagnosis as well as uh, targeting of the breast cancer stem cells. So this is the old data, the breast cancer incidence in India last uh, two decades, but nowadays is uh, increasing the breast cancer uh, numbers in the young women population. If it is uh, uh, two, uh, when the women are diagnosed by newly, uh, every woman uh, newly diagnosed with the breast cancer, one of them is uh, dying up. Almost a 50% uh, incidence, the uh, death rate is increasing nowadays because the breast cancer is the leading cancer in India. Uh, that's why we are working now. So two of them, uh, if it is one is diagnosed, one is uh, going for death due to the treatment failures and also late treatment. Uh, because uh, the people uh, who are diagnosed in the breast cancer, uh, most of the condition is the late uh, stage, uh, uh, around uh, stage three or stage four. The early diagnosis nowadays is uh, missing. So the most uh, common malignancy, the breast cancer is the most uh, common malignancy in women. Uh, the, usually the surgical uh, treatment uh, uh, sometimes works good, but uh, later on they go for the chemotherapy. Uh, the early tra uh, treatment, the breast cancer often uh, become uh, resistant to the chemotherapy. So most of the condition is a tamoxifen or uh, either the doxorubicin or uh, cisplatin as like that. Uh, therapy is a uh, failure nowadays. Uh, the ca cancer stem cells is, uh, uh, play a major role in the development of the multidrug resistant, uh, especially like a development of the MDR or multidrug resistant uh, phenotypes. So self renewal and uh, differentiation regulated by uh, many signaling molecules like uh, Vint Notch and uh, Hitchcock signaling pathways, but uh, recently uh, other pathways also reported uh, to uh, self renew the breast cancer stem cells. So this is the pathways of the breast cancer stem cells. You see that red is the breast cancer stem cells, uh, which is undergo the chemotherapy, the tumor got shrank. And then um, again is the, 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 uh, the signaling pathways, which is induces the self renew and uh, uh, produces the multidrug resistant phenotypes. So these uh, signaling pathways uh, play a major role in the regulating the uh, multidrug resistance and also expressing of the multidrug resistant proteins. The multidrug resistant pro uh, proteins, especially the, the ABCG2 or, uh, or uh, apply p like proteins, uh, uh, play pumping out the most of the chemotherapy drugs. So ABC, uh, G2 is universally expressed in the cancer stem cells, but if you take any cancer stem cells or normal stem cells, uh, uh, sorry, no, normal uh, stem cell, if this uh, ABCG2 is uh, uh, expressed uh, uh, well. So this chemotherapy uh, can kill the bulk of the cancer cells, but even though uh, not killing the uh, this ABCG2 expressing uh, stem cells. 
there is a need to uh, target the uh, breast cancer stem cells to kill the cancer, or else uh, we, we can use this uh, uh, diagnostic tool to uh, identify the breast cancer early. So that's what we are working now. So this is the objective, uh, not only that uh, uh, to target the breast cancer, and also we, we are planning to diagnose early the breast cancer. The, uh, that's what we are developing some kits uh, to identify uh, early um, diagnosis of breast cancer. So this is the isolation strategy so, uh, is identified early in the 2000, but nowadays uh, we are using the same techno technology to isolate the breast cancer from the uh, tissues as well as the cell lines. So we got uh, tissues from the uh, uh, hospital, uh, breast cancer fresh uh, surgical uh, tissues and then digest it using the trypsin. And then uh, we can uh, check it whether uh, there's a stem cells or not. So this is the way we are doing that. So collagenous digestion to identify the uh, uh, mammary stem cells, as well as this is a mammosphere formation. After that, if you put it on the regular plate, it will be start to attach. If it is maintained, uh, 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 non-adherent non culture, it will be uh, maintaining the, the stem cells. This is the structure of the ABCG2. This is otherwise called breast cancer resistant protein. This is a uh, kind of, a, they call this a half transporter. Uh, this half transporter joining together, they pump up the most of the chemotherapy drugs. So we can take it, this one is a, a kind of a, a marker to target it. That is, a, a, can be able to block the uh, ABCG2 activity or else uh, we can uh, use this as a diagnostic uh, uh, markers. So we, uh, uh, this uh, ABCG2, uh, we, uh, uh, we put it on the cDNA. So the first D, uh, cDNA uh, synthesized uh, Dr. Ross in, in 1998, when I was in the Mayo Clinic, we got the cDNA. Uh, still, we have the cDNA. This uh, transfected, this B, uh, stable transfected with the BHK cells to express the ABCG2. This one is the MCF70 ADRVP. That's adriamycin resistant cells. So this naturally identified the, uh, 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 in the ABCG2. And also, this is a mammospheres. They all of them express ABCG2. This is antibody BXP21. This is a label of the Texas RAID. Uh, that's what is expressed here. You can see that uh, that's a stem cells express the ABCG2. So, so our is uh, what is aptamer before we uh, we go to the subject. So aptamer is a single standard DNA or RNA molecule, or otherwise called as a, a peptide. So these molecules can bind to pre-selected targets, including the protein and the peptides are high affinity to particular targets. So here is a select, uh, selection strategy. We use the, uh, that's a BHK ABC uh, cells or ABCG2 expressing cells, or otherwise called a mammospheres. We can use this as our own uh, uh, model. So we, we use these, uh, selects the target using the DNA molecules. So it's a library to select it is uh, whatever the molecules bind that. So that would be uh, uh, keep it. So whatever the unborn, we can wash up. This is a uh, negative selection. Then after that, we can put it on the cells, uh, uh, the, the bound uh, mo uh, molecules, we can uh, take it and then put it on the, the target uh, cells that is a negative selection. Then uh, whatever the bound molecules, we can take it and then clone for the bacterial system to can identify the, uh, the aptamers. So this is the aptamers uh, uh, we screened. We, we, we did it two kinds of aptamer. One is from the uh, BHK21 cells, the other one is the uh, breast cancer stem cells. Uh, so this uh, two kind of aptamers we uh, selected so this is a, a, a BCRP or ABCG2 expressing aptamers. This is the aptamers is nearly it's 100, uh, 100 uh, base pairs. Uh, we can identify it. This is the BCS aptamers. So this aptamers, we put it on the, whatever the aptamer we selected, we put it on the uh, uh, exponential uh, enrichment or our select techniques uh, used to bind it. So the fifth cycle, there is no binding. That's uh, uh, the second cycle. Uh, it's a weak binding. We, we saw 15th cycle uh, is ready to bind it on the cell surface. So here is in the stem cells, uh, the, the aptamers bind to the, uh, uh, the mammospheres, the aptamers binding, uh, you can see that. So this is the strategy. The, uh, this is the differentiated breast cells. Uh, they may not express the ABCG2 well. 
But in the uh, cancerous uh, uh, stem cell, the atom were uh, 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 ready to bite the ABCG. This is a half transporter. This is a um, uh, dimers. The, the dimers ready to transport the uh, chemotherapy drugs. That's what uh, we can use this here. Uh, the the atom is a ligand to ready to bind it. There's a strategy uh, we play. So here is the aptamer specificity uh, bind to the breast cancer stem cells. This is the aptamer is uh, labeled the FHC. Uh, that's, uh, this is ABCG2, uh, there's a Texas red label. So they bind to the uh, uh, stem cells. So even though this mammosphere, uh, so you can find uh, some differentiated cells, uh, may not bind it, but the uh, undifferentiated cells, they can bind it very well. So this is a we cloned uh, this atom. Whatever the binding, we can take it in and then clone the, the. We can identify the sequence. I'll show you the sequence. What are the uh, formed sequences is specifically bind to the stem cells. So these are the clones uh, uh, we got it. Whatever the clones we got it, we screened um, uh, uh, various cells. This is a BHK uh, uh, ABCG2 or BCRP expression cells. We can see very good this A12 aptamer and also. Uh, this is a very confusing, uh, so which one is the best aptamer? That's what uh, we dropped out these BCS cells. So it's, it's, it's non-specifically bind to all the other cells. So uh, here is a aptamer binding this A12, specifically bind to the ABCG2 expressing cells of the cell surface very nicely. This is the sequence of the aptamers. This, uh, this is a monoclonal uh, uh, antibody along with this ABCG2 A12. Uh, specific characters bind to the same cell surface. Uh, uh, cell surface, you can see that this is a uh, binding. This is a Texas red label. This app uh, after fits its state. And then after the uh, uh, trypsin uh, digestion, the aptamer recognizes the BCS cells, but not differentiated cells. So only that bind to the BCS cells, but uh, differentiated cells you cannot see that. So here is a trypsin digestion. Uh, uh, is abolishes binding of aptamers. That means it's binding to the uh, cell surface. Now after the uh, aptamer binding, this is a uh, aptamer uh, A12 fit C, uh, then this is the ABCG2 5D3 antibody binding. So you can see that after the sorting out, you can see that the, the cells are uh, making the mammoth spears. Whatever the stem cell, they can be able to uh, ma make a mammoth spears, but uh, non-stem cells, they cannot uh, make a mammoth spears. The aptamer binding uh, whole breast cancer tissue. We collected the uh, breast tissue and then putting on the aptamer binding buffer. So recently, uh, this is a brand new data. So uh, my student is put into Kishore, uh, he did this experiment. Um, he collected the breast tissue and then put it on incubating on the tissues, whole tissue, freshly cut uh, tissue cells, and put it on incubating the aptamers. The aptamers penetrate the tissues. You can see that cells. This is a fluorescent uh, images. Uh, we recently took it. So we surprised that there is a, how it is, uh, is penetrated. We don't know how it is, but we got the results. Um, this aptamer, this is a uh, froze cut. This is a fresh tissue also. Um, after the uh, bite the surgical uh, uh, human breast cancer tissues, you can find this uh, FITC along with this uh, ABCG2 uh, 5D3 antibody, APC. This uh, recognizes this both of the stem cells. So here is a, a tissue cells uh, uh, from the uh, clinic hospital. This after binding the breast cancer stem cells. This is ARC4 is one of the stem cell marker. This is also a bind to the uh, our aptamers. Along with this uh, ARC4, you can see the MERSH. Uh, so this uh, aptamer is specifically bind to the stem cells. Uh, we conclude like. So here is the uh, estrogen receptor alpha as well as a progesterone receptor alpha, progesterone uh, receptor passive cells. Uh, Along with that, uh, uh, HER2. Uh, this is uh, uh, markers nowadays, so you can uh, check this uh, breast cancer stages as well as the uh, staining pattern based on the uh, positivity, negativity, the, the doctors have prescribed the treatments. So this is the ER alpha uh, positive cells, also uh, uh, tissues, also you can find it, uh, some optimal binding. So this is a paraffin embedded tissues. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not showing that. But anyway, this is a HER2 positive also. I don't know, this is a um, slides that's not showing, I don't know. So this aptamer binding and uh, uh, this is a, uh, our aptamers, uh, uh, whether this is a BCS aptamer, higher rate of endosis is to be checked because uh, the BCS aptamers is internalized inside, but the ABCG aptamers is uh, on the cell surface. But there is a, we have the uh, endocytosis rate is higher in the stem cells or not. That's what we did this study. 
uh, we used uh, endocytosis uh, uh, markers. Uh, one is a clathrin dependent and a clathrin independent markers. Uh, this is the endocytosis well known one. Um, we used clathrin dependent and the clathrin independent uh, markers. So this is a transferrin used a clathrin dependent pathway. Lactoceramide used a clathrin independent pathway. Then we used two inhibitors, clathrin dependent uh, inhibitors, the monodensal cadaverin and a hypertonic sucrose, and then the clathrin independent inhibitors we used. So, uh, so this inhibitors doesn't work. All of them enter inside the cells because it shows these uh, higher uh, endocytosis, uh, endocytosis rate. So this is the structure of the ABCG2 protein uh, um, I showed you earlier. This is a, uh, this is a, a cysteine ring. This is an extracellular loop, or you can see that more, uh, our aptamer. Uh, this is a, a bioinformatic structure of the uh, uh, extracellular region, transmembrane, cytosolic region. This is the NBD regions, uh, ligand binding uh, region. This is a, a sequence of the aptamer 2D structure. This is a happen loop, uh, you can see that. Uh, our aptamer is bind to the extracellular loop. Uh, this is the binding regions of the aptamers, the extracellular loop of the ABCG2. Uh, this is the binding uh, uh, landscape of the ABCG aptamer complex. 2D, uh, this is the aptamer is binding in the extracellular loop. So our designation aptamers is, is specifically recognized the breast cancer stem cells, both the cell culture and the primary breast cancer tissues. Mm -hmm. We found uh, breast cancer stem cells have higher rate of endocytosis than the differentiated cells. Uh, it will be advanced to advantages to design the aptamer coated nanoparticle packed on the SAR RNA or chemotherapy drugs, or else we can use this as a, uh, a diagnostic marker. So uh, we did recently, uh, this uh, we got the tissues, uh, sorry, the cells bleds uh, from the uh, breast cancer patient. So we used our aptamer to check whether it's a binding. We can see um, uh, so small binding over there. This is a percentage, uh, I think, uh, 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 so you can see that 0.1 percent nearly is binding the aptamer. So, so we whether with the cells from the really from the breast cancer or not, we need to confirm it. And also, we we are planning to make the nano chips. So we are coated with the aptamers to check the um, the circulating breast cancer stem cells in the early. That's what we we are planning to do this one. So this is our idea is to to target using this. Uh, 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 Aptamer encapsulated uh, uh, liposomes to deliver our drugs. So I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators as well as uh, 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 Dr. Bala Murugan and also my student. And, and uh, my friend is Ilongon is here. So he provided an antibody to check the ARC4 uh, SOX2. Uh, and also Dr. Danavadi uh, did the um, uh, immunohistochemistry as well as the immunofluorescence. And, uh, and also, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uma Sankar uh, Vetrivel, he's with Tuberculosis Research Institute. He's, uh, he did a wonderful job in the uh, bioinformatics. Thank you very much. I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Nice presentation. Uh, ARC4 is a transcription factor, and October is a ligand. How, how, how do you relate that ACT4 is activated uh, there uh, or the, to binding the ligand ACT4 is not expressed? Do you have any kind of uh, establish the link between the ACT4 and ACT4 ligand and the transcription factor? No, sir. We are looking for these stem cells that uh, one of the ACT4 SOX2, they all are the expressing these stem cells. So we want to know whether it is uh, the ARC4 also expressed in this breast cancer or not. So that's what we did. It, this ARC4 also expressed our aptma also recognized this breast cancer. Uh, Kanagaraj, yes. interesting talk. Um, so uh, you did say that cancer stem cells, the breast cancer stem cells express a ABCG2 at a higher level and you used your app to target that. Yes. Do you mean to say that uh, other cancer stem cells do not express ABCG2? It's an excellent question. It's most of the talk when they deliver, the people are asked the same questions. So this uh, other cancer, uh, not only cancer cell, uh, the normal uh, stem cells also express the ABCG2. But in the case, uh, while on the cancer, uh, to need to diagnose this, but we need to identify some of the target. So uh, not only like that, but a CD44 or, or like that, we have to identify. But anyway, we want, we want to kill the cancer st stem cells, we need to target something. That's what we, we are doing. That. Okay, the second piece is this, uh, your aptamer, uh, 
by any chance does it bind to other ABC proteins? Or is it very specific no, no. for G2? Yes. Uh, we tried with the MRP on the peak glycoprotein. No, it's not binding. Okay, thank you. Hello, Raj. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. No. I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Rajesh Kumar to start with the student presentation. Thank you, Chair Sir. And moving on, we would have three world presentations, uh, starting with Dr. Rajani Kant, Dr. Uh, Naharika Dhan, then Dr. Ch uh, Chandana B uh, from BHU. So first speaker would be Dr. Rajani Kant, and he's from Mysore University. And he would be talking about the uh, talk on evolutionary mating discriminations in Nestua subgroup of Drosophila. Floor is yours, 10 minutes, yours. Thank you. If you exceed the time, there'll be a mark cut, 0.5 marks. So uh, today I'm going to convince you of why love is not blind. And I'm going to tell you a story of how mate discrimination is uh, evolves in Nasuta subgroup of Drosophila. <clears throat> so I'm broadly interested in the question, how do new species form? So I mainly focus on the evolutionary genetic basis of species formation. So before we dive in, uh, let me tell you what species are. So the most accepted definition of species concept was given by Ernst Mayer, where he's uh, defined species as a group of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from each other. So reproductive isolation is the hallmark of speciation. So reproductive isolation is said to be achieved when a group of population are no more mating, or if they do, they do not produce a viable hybrid. So Dobzhansky classified reproductive isolation in, into broadly uh, two categories, pre-mating and po post-mating. So pre-mating isolation exists in the form of sexual isolation and post-mating isolation exists in the form of gametic incompatibility, hybrid inviability, and hybrid sterility. So we, we also study uh, post-mating isolation. We recently published this paper studying the uh, ev evolution of uh, spermatogenesis genes in Nasuta subgroup. If anybody is interested, they can take a look. So uh, today I'll be talking about the pre-mating isolation and the reproductive behaviors in flies and how mate discrimination evolves. So uh, when two species split in uh, allopatry and when they come back in sympatry in the secondary contacts, there will be hybridization between the species, which results in hybrid incompatibility in the form of hybrid inviability or hybrid sterility, which is, uh, so reinforcement drives the evolution of a stronger mate discrimination in order to avoid the mating between wrong pairs. So it's important that we understand how natural selection act on the traits, the reproductive traits that are involved in mate discrimination. So uh, in Drosophila, uh, mating is sequential, where it involves the visual cues, olfactory cues, gustatory cues, and uh, auditory cues. So uh, in the uh, first stage of uh, mating, the flies orient each other, where they use the visual and olfactory cues, and then they touch each other, where they're uh, actually tasting and smelling the pheromones through gustatory and uh, 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 and uh, gustatory and uh, olfactory cues, and then uh, the male produces a song where the female hears it through the aristae, uh, there the auditory cues are at function, and if they like what they see, what they hear, and what they taste and smell, the male and female goes on to copulate. So, as I said, courtship is often multimodal, and it involves multiple signals, and uh, this multiple signals increase the effectiveness of the uh, signal transmission, which results in a stronger mate discrimination. So, uh, in order to understand uh, the role of individual mate, uh, mating signals, uh, we can eliminate that individual signal. So when we do that, if it, it completely eliminates the reproductive success, then we say, if it does not affect the reproductive success, then we say that particular mating signal is redundant. And if it completely eliminates the mating success, then we say that particular signal is essential. And if it does not affect the mating success, but if it affects the speed of the mating, then we call it uh, the synergistic effect. So to study this, I study a cluster of species called Nasuta subgroup of Drosophila 
what makes this subgroup very interesting is that they have very uh, less morphological divergence and they are karyotypically very similar. They are classified into two groups based on these markings on their uh, forehead. And uh, they have undergone a frequent speciation events in a very short duration of time. And they are at a different levels of reproductive isolation. So uh, in order to understand uh, the role of individual signals from this, from this repertory of the uh, different signals, we ablate uh, signal production or the signal reception, and we see how it affects the copulation. And then we also look into the mating timing data. So the first thing that we, first experiment that we do, did is to uh, study the effect of light on mating success. So what we did is we kept, we conducted mating experiment in light and then in, the, in dark, and we looked into the presence of larvae larval activity. So what we observed is after seven days, what we observed is that the flies that were kept in dark uh, did not have any larval activity. So that tells us that visual signals are essential for mating success. So further to understand the effect of auditory signals. So we ablated the wings which produce the song and the aristae which hears the song. Uh, and then we performed mating experiments. So what we found out that uh, the, when the wings and aristae was were ablated, it did not uh, it did not affect the courtship. The courtship was normal, but it significantly reduced the number of meetings. So that tells us that uh, uh, these auditory signals uh, are acting synergistically, uh, and it, it only reduces the mating, but it does not affect or eliminate the mating. So further to understand the effect of olfactory and gustatory caves. So we removed the four-leg tarsi, which are used as gustatory uh, structures and antennae, which is used as the olfactory structure. And we performed the mating experiment. So this eliminated the mating completely. What you are seeing here is the number of pairs that were that coated. So it, it significantly reduced uh, the number of courtship uh, and completely eliminated the mating. And when the female did not have a four-leg tarsi, it did not affect the uh, courtship at all because females don't use the uh, four-leg tarsi. So this tells us that uh, the removal of four-leg tarsi and antennae completely eliminated the copulation. And uh, hence these uh, cues are absolutely necessary. So to bring, to understand the evolutionary genetic basis of this. So we looked into the evolution of genes that are involved in mate discrimination. So there are a class of chemosensory receptor genes that are expressed in antennae and foreleg. And these genes are known to evolve through birth and death model of evolution, which is uh, they undergo a frequent uh, deletion and duplication. They also undergo a uh, positive selection where they diverge rapidly. So there are different class of uh, these genes, the gustatory receptors, olfactory receptors, and inotrophic receptors. So we basically uh, annotated these genes in uh, Nasuta subgroup of Drosophila, and we, uh, we looked into the kind of selection these genes are evolving through. So uh, us evolutionary geneticists look into the uh, pattern of uh, non-synonymous and synonymous uh, changes that happen in, in these genes. And we look into this uh, omega value, which tells us that if a gene is evolving through positive selection, the omega is greater than one. So we first performed the gene-wide uh, selection uh, for uh, these genes, and we found out that all the gustatory receptor genes showed the uh, signature of positive selection. And then we uh, performed the codon-based selection analysis, which showed that there, there are these particular sites, these number of sites in these gustatory receptor genes uh, showed uh, signature of positive selection. So then we... Uh, took these genes, this is GR39A, which is involved in uh, discriminating uh, between species uh, pheromones. So we modeled this protein. Uh, this uh, this uh, transmembrane protein has these three domains, the intracellular domain and the transmembrane domain and the extracellular domain. And most of the sites that we found to be evolving faster are found in the uh, intracellular domain, which might be playing a role uh, in signal transduction during uh, the mate recognition, due to which the uh, gustatory receptors play a vital role in the mating and the, uh, inconsistent with that, we see the evolution of these genes. Uh, so the takeaways from my talk are uh, the visual cues are absolutely necessary. So love is definitely not blind. Uh, and auditory cues have a synergistic effect on mating and olfactory and gustatory cues are essential. And consistent with that, we see the uh, rapid evolution of the genes that are involved in uh, the gustatory receptors that are involved in mate discrimination. So I'd like to thank uh, the lab and my guide uh, and my funding agencies. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to Eva Wilson, who passed away two days ago. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rajnikan. Uh, we, we have finished well within time.
and leave some decent time for questioning as well. Thanks. So, um, do you want to extrapolate your data set to non drosophila organisms, including human beings? Uh, quite not. So love is blind in case of human beings? Oh, no, not for human beings. Okay, it's only for the flies. <laughs> for flies, yeah. it's not blind. But for, for even us... In flies, even in flies, there are other species which actually uh, don't need light to mate. So this is only for uh, Nasuta subgroup of Drosophila. Where the... Okay, for us, it's blind. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very hilarious question. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to know, uh, have you checked the role of serotonin and, and uh, dopamine in this? Oh, we did not look into any of the uh, hormonal aspect of it. This is more, oh, we, were, we were interested in what cues are mainly involved in mate discrimination and the genes that are involved in reception. Yeah, because reception. Uh, the, uh, in insects particularly and in, in case of diphtherians, okay. uh, serotonin and dopamine plays a major role for courtship behavior also okay uh, uh, that is that i think is uh, it's it's actually studied uh, in flies so that rewarding uh, mechanism that happens when the flies uh, you know when they scent, smell and taste the pheromones that rewarding mechanism is being studied but uh, yeah uh, my my study mainly focused on the genes that are involved in producing this yeah uh, but pheromones are sensed by the same receptors and uh, the receptors that's right. Yeah, yeah pheromones. So. But I did not study the hormonal aspect of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We will have probably last question. Yeah. Rajinikant, it's a nice presentation. Uh, in fact, did you, uh, you have taken light as one of the parameters. Uh, you could have gone for infra longer wavelength of light, infrared rays. It Actually, it's an important role yeah. uh, in any of the animal groups, especially in deep, deep sea animals. That, that's right. Actually, we have done some experiments uh, doing the mating experiment uh, in a red light because we did not know what was going on inside the dark chamber, what the flies were doing. So uh, when we see in the red light, the flies don't approach, don't even approach each other. Oh, okay. So yeah, we have studied that in light. So I just did because not. Visible range and even among the visible range of light, okay. we could have selected particularly blue or depending on the wavelength of the light. Yeah, yeah. Wavelength of the light plays an important. That's right. That's right. Of course, yeah. you have studied infrared rays. No, uh, yeah. You know, we only studied in the red uh, light. Red light, yeah. So you can now study the invisible wavelength of light. And yeah, visible. Rays. Yeah. So the, the best way to study that. that would, that Sorry. will definitely give us some of the important results. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, you can, can just. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajinikant. I think you have triggered not much lightning, you know. Hope this continues. Uh, just give. The same uh, line of presentations we have uh, Niharika Dhan. And uh, she would be sharing her things on, I mean, research things on molecular insights of kispeptin and melatonin receptors in particular to hypothalamic neuronal signaling. Naharika, you have close for 10 minutes. Go ahead. Good afternoon, one and all present here. So my topic is molecular insights into the kispeptin and melatonin receptor expression in primary cultures of hypothalamic neurons. So basically this study focuses on two players, kispeptin and melatonin. What is their role during the onset of puberty? So talking about puberty, puberty is a biological transition that the vertebrates go through where uh, the individual shows first signs of sexual maturity and they become capable of reproduction. But how is it controlled? So it is controlled by the central reproductive axis, that is the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis or the HPG axis, where certain hormonal signals are transmitted from the brain to the gonads and certain hormones are released and the puberty starts. But how does this axis start? 
So here comes the role of our first player, that is kiss pectin. There are other certain other factors as well which is responsible for this, but till date it is still unclear how the mechanism of the puberty works. So talking about kiss pectin, kiss pectin acts as the major gatekeeper in the onset of puberty. Uh, Recent studies have shown that kiss peptin goes and binds with the kiss peptin receptor and together they stimulate the GnRH release. Uh, two studies by DROX and Seminara, they linked that, uh, they, they have shown that the mutation of kiss one r gene resulted in the impaired onset of puberty and also hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in humans. In another study, it is found that uh, the, when the kiss one gene was completely knocked out, it suppressed the LH and the GnRH surge. So from this, we can say that there is there might be some role of kiss peptin during the onset of puberty. Now talking about our next player, melatonin. So melatonin is a photoperiod hormone which is released from the pineal gland more during the nighttime and less during the daytime. Studies have shown that at the time of puberty, melatonin reaches to its lowest levels. And if it doesn't, and if excessive amount of melatonin is present, it resulted in the delay uh, uh, of the onset of puberty. In another study, uh, after providing long day conditions, it was observed that the kiss peptin, the expression of the kiss peptin increased. Now, this study shows that there might be an antagonistic role between the kiss peptin and the melatonin. In another study, melatonin has been found to indirectly, uh, melatonin has been found to affect the estradiol level, which then indirectly affects, the, uh, which then indirectly activates the GnRH centers. On the other hand, the estradiol, they are not present on the GnRH neurons, but they are found to be present on the kiss peptin neurons. Uh, so this suggests that they, uh, there might be a role of estrogen in the activation of HPG axis during the onset of puberty. Uh, so the data is scarce in terms of levels of melatonin, kiss peptin, and estradiol, but from the literature uh, that we have studied, we can hypothesize that before puberty, the melatonin levels are high, which inhibits the gonadocyte from getting activated. But during the time of puberty, the melatonin reaches its lowest levels, which then activates the gonadocyte and the kiss peptin goes and triggers the GnRH release. So the present study is intended to understand the expression pattern of the kiss peptin receptor, kiss peptin GnRH and melatonin receptor under the influence of estradiol, melatonin and lucentol treatment. So these were the proposed objectives. Uh, objective one, to establish the primary culture of the hypothalamic cells of rat. And objective two was to check the gene expression pattern, that is KISS-1, KISS-1R, GNRH1, and MTNR1A uh, under the estradiol of melatonin and lucentol uh, treatment. Coming to the methodology, so the, fir to, uh, the first objective was to establish the primary cell culture. And for that, the protocol uh, has been referred from the mentioned paper, Kanasaki et al. Uh, so basically 21 days, uh, 21 days weaning rats were obtained and they were uh, sacrificed by standard procedure and the, uh, the brain was dissected out and the hypothalamus was uh, dissected. After that, the protocol was performed as it is mentioned here in the form of flowchart. There were some modifications done for the standardization of the protocol. Uh, the first modification was done in the cell wash step where two different washes were given. One was tried with the media wash and the other with the HBSS wash. And then the cell, uh, the cell, the condition of the cell was observed. And the second uh, modification was done in the concentrations of FPS, that is fetal bovine serum, and in the concentration of FGF, that is fibroblast growth factor. And once the culture was established, the cells were then subjected to cell count by trifling blue method. Uh, coming to the second objective, that was to check the expression pattern. So once the um, the, uh, the culture was established. It was then divided into nine experimental groups and the respective treatment regime was given for seven days. So there were five major groups that is control, melatonin, melatonin plus antagonist that is loose and all, estradiol and estradiol plus melatonin. And then uh, each of this group were given in two doses, low dose and high dose. Uh, after that, the total RNA isolation was done by the trisal method. It was then reverse transcribed to cDNA. And finally, real-time PCR was carried out to check the gene expression. Coming to the results. So this is the microscopic image of the successfully establishment of the primary cell culture. So DMM media was used, which was supplemented with 15% FPS, 10 NG per ml FGF, and 1% antibiotic solution. 
also as i mentioned before two cell washes were given so when the cell were uh, when the cells were exposed to the media wash less cell death was observed as it was happening in the hbss wash so finally the media wash was selected the morphology was observed to be round in shape and the cells were adherent to the surface the stability was observed to be for the cells remain stable for 10 days and after 10 days a decline was observed okay so these different combinations that were tested that were tried and tested of fbs and fgf three concentration of fbs were taken 10% 12% and 15% same goes with fgf 10 ng per ml 12 and 15 and uh, the cell density and the health and the condition of the cell was checked and it was observed that among uh, the um, it was checked in four different arts and it was observed that among the uh, all the conditions the seventh combination that is 15% fbs and 10 ng per ml fga was found to be the most suitable one also at 72 hours and at 96 hours the cell growth was not observed much but it remained stable unlike in the other conditions where a decline was observed now these are the microscopic images of other, uh, the other combinations that were tried but low density and unhealthy cells were observed now coming to the gene expression results similar results were obtained in the kisvanar kis1 and gnrh1 genes it was observed that uh, in in both the doses of melatonin a decreased expression of the genes were observed and in both the doses of estradiol an increased expression of the genes was observed uh, again a decreased expression was observed in the high dose of estradiol and melatonin and uh, coming to the mtnr 1a gene expression a complete opposite results were observed so uh, the expression increased in both the doses of melatonin whereas the expression decreased in both the doses of estradiol so uh, the rat primary hypothalamic culture was successfully standardized with the supplementation of dmem 15% fbs cnng per ml fgf and 1% antibiotic solution uh the doubling time was found to be 18 hours uh the cells were uh, forming neurospheres at the beginning and then soon after 24 hours the morphology changed they uh, attained the round morphology uh so as we as we saw that in both the doses of estradiol the expression increased the expression of kis, uh, gnrh1 kis1 and kis1 r increased and in the doses of melatonin it decreased also when estradiol and melatonin dose was given in that uh, expression was observed to be increased uh, in the low dose whereas decrease in the high dose the decrease we can say it was decreasing because uh, the melatonin was acting as more potent in the gnrh1 kis1 and kis1 r genes whereas the expression of mtnr1 a was significantly up regulated with both the doses of melatonin and down regulated with both the doses of estradiol exactly opposite happened and when lucentol and melatonin uh, treatment was given we can see that in low dose not, not significant changes were observed but in the high dose the mtnr1 a gene down regulated because here lucentol is acting as a more potent so uh, this study opens up new avenues for the interaction of melatonin and kisleptin and it strongly suggests that there might be a link between them also it proves that estradiol plays a pivotal role in activating the hpg axis during the pubertal onset which will be further validated with in vivo studies and together downstream markers with the icc studies will open up the mechanistic control of estradiol melatonin and kisleptin role in pubertal onset thank you uh thank you niharika we will have couple of questions uh hello uh, nirika so i have just two things uh, in your introduction slide you have told about gnih and uh, have you checked gnih as you have checked the gnrh no, sir, you have not, not checked hormone. gnih but no. i think inhibitory hormone is the most potent thing for any 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 regulation any any releasing hormone any promoting hormone which is always on it is not nothing but gnih is the main factor and when you are giving melatonin as melatonin is a chronobiotic molecule so uh, how you are adding to the medium you are adding simultaneously or you are giving some time gap uh, when you are adding 
Okay, so first we are establishing the cell culture. Once we are uh, doing the cell seeding, we are waiting for 24 hours for it to get adherent. And after 24 hours, then we are at, we are giving the respective doses. No, no. I, when you are at co-administration, you are giving the melatonin. Yes, low dose and high dose, yes. The co melatonin and estradiol. Yes, yes, yes. So when you are giving melatonin and estradiol, are you, are you putting it simultaneously or you are having simultaneously sir. simultaneously yes. and there are different groups were also that only individual for melatonin and individual for estradiol as well okay. mike please to Pradeep, sir okay quick good presentation i have some clarification so you have isolated primary cells uh, hypothalamus has many cells Yes, sir. Which specific cell type you isolated? Did you identify anything? No, sir. We have identified the entire hypothalamus and the culture was established. Our main aim was to... So, so whole hypothalamic cell culture? Yes. It is not any specific cell No, type. sir. Then what about the purity of the cells? Sorry? Purity of the cells, viability of the cells which you have isolated. Any test you did? Uh... No, sir. For purity of the cells, we didn't do any test, but it was observed since we were getting uh, kisspeptin is known to be present there in hypothalamus. No, that has nothing to do. Just I asked whether. No, sir. No, sir. And then last but one slide, you said the two other people also did similar studies. And what is the novel thing in your study? Uh, so our main aim was to first establish the culture because the cell line which is available in that uh, the cell line is of mature cells. Uh, it is. Uh, we wanted to do it in the pre-pubertal cells. So this culture, the 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 culture which we have established is of the pu uh, pre-pubertal cells. You have not answered my question. Sorry. You have not answered my question. Okay. I asked what is novel from your study. Others have already done. You said. Then what is novel in your study? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I'm I'm uh, apologize, apologizing for this uh, you know interruption, but we don't have time left for further questions. So we'll uh, stop over here, and maybe Niharika can have yeah. time with them. Uh, subsequently, you can catch them subsequently of the dais. Thank you so much. Give her a round of applause. Um, the third oral presentation we have is uh, from Chandana B. She's from uh, Mysore University, and she would be speaking on homozygous haplotypes blocks uh, susceptible for diabetic neuropathy. Again, neurobiology uh, stuff. Uh, Chandana, you have 10 minutes. Take you now. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. So today, I'm going to present my work on identification of homozygous haplotype blocks susceptible for diabetic nephropathy. Uh, yeah, these are the contents which have included in this presentations. And the motivation behind this work is like the diabetes, which is a worldwide health issue. And it is very common, complex and a metabolic disorder, which is inheritable and also can be acquired with the uh, lifestyle changes. And diabetic nephropathy is an extended version of diabetes. Like uh, the, uh, it's a kidney damage because of diabetes. And there is an, uh, we can't identify or the, uh, identify this disease in a clinical databases. So uh, here we need an, another approach uh, other than the clinical data sets, like uh, uh, we can go with the genetics and a genomic analysis where we can find the inheritable genes responsible for causing a diabetic nephropathy. And with an advanced in NGS technology, uh, which provides a multiple platform for the uh, diagnostic methods in identification of complex disorders, and one such method would be uh, the recessive homozygous haplotype identification method. So this method identifies the recessive genes uh, which are responsible uh, in the causing disease and uh, by considering the homozygous regions in our, uh, identical haplotypes. Uh, so these haplotypes are usually higher in frequency in a diseased individual compared to the normal healthy ones. And their plays uh, this plays a significant role in disease expression and progression. So introduction, uh, homozygosity is the identical uh, alleles for the particular triad. And whereas in runs of homozygosity is a contiguous regions of a genome uh, where an individual is homozygous across all sides. Here they use the uh, SNPs as a markers and in between those SNP markers, they'll check for the homozygosity. 
and haplotypes are the alleles or the set of alleles or the homozy or the particular chromosomal segment which has been inherited as such from the parents to the offsprings and the genome wide data suggests that haplotypes or the runs runs of homozygous is universally common so if we take a south indian population uh, here we can see a high frequency of runs of homozygosity because south india is actually um, very important or uh, we can consider uh, because of their consanguinous consanguinous relationships uh, and uh, there is a two types of rare runs of homo homozygosity that is uh, long reads and short reads long reads can be identified in a consanguinous analysis whereas short reads in a um, distinct populations so these are the objectives uh, to identify the regions of homozygosity shared among the affected individuals and the haplotypes and the mutations in that particular homozygous region and to explore its significant role in progression of disease so this is the methods we took uh, 12 clin preclinically diagnosed diabetic nephropathic patients and whole exam analysis using the illumina platform and the haplotype calls were uh, called using a homozygosity mapper and the genes were identified in that particular homozygous regions uh, we used gene distributed rna genome viewer uh, tools and uh, lg link uh, linkage disequilibrium eqtl analysis and the snp annotations was done using the software regulum db and haplorec so this is a graphical output from the homozygosity mapper where it shows the two uh, homozygous uh, other the two chromosomes which have uh, expressed the homozygous regions and uh, in that homo uh, two chromosomes uh, we could identify 10 uh, homozygous regions with 17 genes which includes both protein coding and non coding genes but here we have considered only the coding protein coding genes so uh, chromosome 5 it has got a long stretch of 4690 base pairs homozygous regions and the only gene is a pcbd2 whereas on chromosome 6 we can see eight genes on different chromosomal positions so this is a graphical representation of a homozygous haplotype region and here uh, the upper arrows shows the chromosomal positions and the red color and the shades of red colors uh, shows the homozygous um, conditions and the darker shade uh, tells the higher intensity of the homozygous region whereas blue uh, is a color which signifies heterozygous and the lines uh, on the uh, on the red bars are the minor allele frequency for that particular homozygous region so this is again on a chromosome 6 here we can see on different chromosomal positions with a bunch of genes so this is a general mechanism where we can see how diabetic nephropathy can be uh, progress from the diabetic conditions so here have uh, there is there are a lot of mechanisms involved in here as it is a complex disorder but i have considered here only the genes which have identified and the involved mechanism as in such like any one it is a protein coding gene it codes for a protein neuraminidase enzyme Uh, which is an important in insulin receptor signaling pathway and also it is involved in a, a lipid metabolism and another gene slc44a4 it's a salute carrier uh, gene uh, this uh, these kind of uh, genes are very important uh, in oxidative stress as if there is an, any changes in these alterations of the gene expression levels has been altered uh, we can uh, uh, there there will be an abnormal uh, maintenance of the homeo uh, electrolyte homeostasis uh, so next further with the secondary biomolecules signaling uh, transductions and there is a genes involved in transcription factors dna methylation and chromatin remodeling and further inflammatory response which is an important uh, causing factor for diabetic nephropathy so uh, further uh, to identify the mutations in that particular haplotypes we have considered the rsids rsids are nothing but the which are already well known annotated snps and uh, it's the software regulum db which characterizes the rsid based uh, by giving them a rank based on um, uh, available functional data sets such as chromatin states which tells us about the epigenetic uh, marks as a uh, enhancers or the promoter where, where at that position the chromosomal position and that rsid positions and the bound protein so these are the regulatory bound proteins 
uh, which are specially bound at that positions and the transecutial gene analysis. So transecutial is like, these are the genes because of these mutations are um, differentially expressed in the phenotypic conditions. Or oh, if you check for the phenotypic expressions and differentially expressed genes, because of these mutations, we can see uh, the other genes which are also differentially expressed. So for an example, if I consider a complement factor B, a gene, uh, a component of an alternative pathway, that is a complement activations. So this triggers an immune response um, by uh, activating the B lymphocytes and monocytes. So uh, this is again, an important factor in causing the diabetic nephropathy. So this is an output from the haploreg where it says the linkage disequilibrium for this RSID. So linkage disequilibrium uh, says it's a where there is a minor, uh, very light min minor frequency of um, sorry crossing over. So there is a very light minor uh, frequency of crossing over. Hence, they have given the score 1, 1 and 0 0.99, 0 0.98 means there is a very, very, very less or minute crossing over has been happening between these two RSIDs. So that means these two RSIDs are inherited together. And as we can see, the other inherited RSID is the RDBP gene, which is again an regulatory protein that is RNA binding protein. So, which controls RNA polymerase to elongations. Uh, with that gene, if we see, uh, look into that uh, expression quantitative triad locus, again, there's the genes, uh, or these three genes, which is present on chromosome six and which we have identified in the homozygous region. So, this is the general mechanism or the pathway uh, where I have included all the uh, nine genes from the homozygous region and the three common genes which were present in 12 subjects. Uh, and here there is, uh, there is a link between the progression the, or the mechanism in a causing a progression of a diabetic nephropathy as we can see here the chronic kidney disease and the uh, regulation alterations in the uh, uh, filtration process in a podocyte and glucose metabolism. So this is the general pathway uh, in the progression of a disease. So these genes are all interconnected and interlinked uh, in the mechanism. So this is the position of the haplotype segment uh, region on the chromosomes. So uh, summary, yes, uh, advances in the NGS technology will provide us and multiple platform approaches of other uh, other opportunities uh, to diag uh, come up with and diagnostic methods and identification of a complex disorder. And here we have identified two uh, homozygous haplotype regions on chromosome five and chromosome six with nine genes. And the pathways are very much related to the uh, diabetic nephropathy. And LD and EQTL analysis can tell us the other genes which have been in, uh, involved in the progression of disease with these uh, uh, mutations. And haplotype, finally, haplotype blocks, which we have identified, can be considered as a marker in a diagnostic. Uh, I thank DBT for the uh, Government of India for the funding and the University of Mysore Chairperson Department of Genetics and Genomics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chandana. Uh, she has discussed about the haplotypes in neuropathy of diabetes. And we had Dr. Pradeep for uh, one question. Mike, please. So these nine genes that you talked about, which are homozygous in these guys who have uh, diabetic nephropathy. Yes. So uh, do you really mean to say that those genes are overexpressed in these patients? Um, yeah, uh, it's not like overexpressed. They've been like, it can be overexpressed or suppressed no. because these are involved in a regulation mechanism. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. They could be involved. All the genes will be involved in some regulatory mechanisms. Some of them will be overexpressed. Some of them yeah. will be underexpressed. Being homozygous would mean that you have two copies. Both the yes, copies sir. could be read, yes, sir. transcribed and yeah. translated. Yes, sir. Uh, does it happen? In literature, what does it say? These genes, are they associated? The expression differences of these nine genes are they in any way connected with diabetic nephropathy based on the literature? Yes, sir. It is connected. Like it is differentially expressed. Okay. So, so which are the genes which are upregulated in uh, diabetic nephropathy? Um, that have to check. Like we didn't check like that, sir. Uh, which is upregulated or downregulated? We just looking for the 
uh, regulation mechanism that's it. so all the see if you do an ngs you will get names of genes yeah and they will fit into some regulatory pathway that is nothing nothing surprising but the thing is to say that because of homozygosity of a given gene or a given set of genes Sir, uh, a disease syndrome comes uh, should be based on some background information. Yes, sir. But uh, as in such work, when see one RDBP gene, which I told, it's actually lagging the uh, RNA polymerase elongation. So here we can see that gene, uh, that RDBP, which is going to bind a particular protein, will be uh, suppressed. So, so it's like in case the gene expression changes. Yeah. It being homozygous is one thing. Uh, in that patient who is homozygous for that given gene, if the expression level doesn't change then your story has uh, no meaning. That's right. Concern it is common in so it is important. Is it based on any scientific data or your own statement? No, sir, sir. Like most of uh, the disease conditions, uh, we can, uh, the consaginous analysis, we see most in a South Indian conditions. So, based not, on that, compared uh, to not anybody did a comparison. No. Oh, speak with some evidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. No, I am asking when you make a South India compared to not, then you have a whole uh, picture. That is only two states. Yeah. So I, I think we have a very uh, brilliant deliberations on. Neuroendocrine uh, biology, as well as uh, the germ cells, in particular to uh, you know cyclins, as well as uh, some development of chips for breast cancer diagnosis and uh, PCO definitely this ongoing thing. So thanking all the speakers and our presenters, I will hand over the mic to uh, the chair, Dr. Uh, Ramchandran. Thank you. Uh, my co-chair has already summed up about the session. So I'm left with thanking all the speakers, <laughs> the senior people for their talk and the young people for their presentation. I think they're quite interesting. They are bold enough to make their presentations. And I congratulate all of those students who presented. And I also take this opportunity to thank the organizers for having given this opportunity for us to share this. Session. Thank you. Over to the organizers. Before we wind the scientific session, uh, let's give another round of applause to our chair and co-chair. Uh, one of the most important things, they manage the time really well and we finish the session at sharp 1.30. We finish, we finish the sharp session at sharp 1.30. Uh, okay, so at this point, I'd like to uh, ask our chair, Professor A.V. Ramachandran, to uh, present the certificates to our uh, invited speakers. So I request uh, Professor Ashutosh Haldar, Professor Pradeep Kumar, and Professor, Professor Kanagaraj to come up on stage to receive the certificates. My apology to uh, the audience where I have interrupted because of the time paucity, we have two somewhere in the hold. So, Professor Ashita Shaldar. Uh, Professor Pradeep Kumar. We'll give uh, Professor Kanakaraj's certificate separately. Oh, is he here? Oh, he's not here. He's not, he's not around. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, our co-chair, uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumar Jha, to distribute the certificates to our uh, student speakers, uh, Rajnikant C, uh, Niharika Dhan, and Chandana B, please uh, come on to the stage to receive your certificates. Rajnikant, Niharika. And uh, finally, Chandra.
Okay, um, I'd like to, uh, we'd like to uh, give some mementos to our chairs. So I'd like to invite Professor, our uh, former chairman of the Department of Genetics, Professor N.V. Ramachandra to uh, give the, um, the mementos to our chair and co-chair. Okay, thank you one and all for uh, having a successful session one. Um, if there are presenters in the group that haven't submitted their PowerPoint presentations that uh, we are expecting for this afternoon, please do so during the lunchtime uh, so that we have our presentations ready as we have had for the morning sessions. Thank you very much. So we'll meet back at 12.15 for the session two. Sorry, 215, 215, 215.